Hello everyone and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today we're discussing how DNA connected and solved four different cold cases in Denver from a spree serial killer active in the late 70s to the early 80s. Let's get into it. On December 7th, 1978 in Denver, Colorado, Antonio Livides arrived home from work at 6 p.m. He instantly knew something was wrong. His nine-month-old daughter was in the swing on a back porch alone, and his three-year-old was watching TV in the dark. Antonio immediately went upstairs and looked in his bedroom and found his wife, 33-year-old Madeline Ferre Levides, in a pool of blood. Madeline and Antonio married in Philadelphia, where Madeline had worked for a children's nature magazine called Ranger Rick, and research for the magazine let her travel the world. She had her two daughters in Philadelphia and wrote a children's science book. The family had recently moved to Denver, Colorado, where Antonio got a job at an architectural office. At the crime scene, it was discovered that Madeline had been stabbed several times, and there were other details of the case being withheld, but law enforcement confirmed that there were sexual elements in addition to the stabbing. There was no sign of forced entry, so it is believed that her attacker had knocked on the door, then forced their way into the home and made her go to the bedroom. There, the assailant stabbed her. The two children were not harmed in the attack. Authorities had no leads and said that at the time that Madeline had been killed, authorities had been hampered by several unsolved murders and resources had been stretched thin. They did state that Madeline's murder was unrelated to all their other cases. Several samples of forensic evidence were taken and stored, but as it was 1978, there was not much they could do with DNA evidence. Two years later, on Sunday, August 10th, 1980, Denver police responded to a call on the 500 block of East 17th Street to a report of a woman lying in the road. Responding officers discovered 53-year-old Dolores Barajas, who suffered multiple stab wounds. Dolores died at the scene before medical help arrived. Dolores had been walking on her way to work at the Fairmont Hotel. She had recently moved to Denver for the summer to visit family. Originally from El Paso, Texas, that day was supposed to be her last shift of work before moving back to Texas. She was a mother, a grandmother, and very much loved by her family. The senseless attack had left law enforcement baffled, and for many years, there had been no connection to Madeline's murder case. Later that year, another woman was found on December 24, 1980. She could not be identified at the time, but was later identified as 27-year-old Gwendolyn Harris. Gwendolyn's body was found with multiple stab wounds, money was still on her body, eliminating robbery as motive. Gwen had last been seen at the Apollo Club Lounge on December 20th, four days before her body had been found. Again, little headway was made in solving her murder. Forensic evidence was collected and stored, and because it had been so different from Madeline and Dolores' murder, the three cases were not connected. Then, on January 24, 1981, a teenager named Antoinette Parks was found dead in a field next to 64th Avenue and Broadway in Denver. Annette was stabbed 23 times. She had been a 17-year-old high school student. She loved children and hoped to work with kids someday. Antoinette was just over six months pregnant at the time of her death. Her family said that she'd been very excited to be a mother herself. After exhausting all leads and evidence from these cases, all four cases would go cold. The circumstances of the cases had all been different. Madeline had been murdered in her home when a man presumably walked up to her door, barged in during broad daylight, and attacked her while her children were also in the home. Dolores had been attacked in the street in the early morning hours. Gwen had been abducted on her way home in the very early morning hours, and Antoinette, a teenager, was abducted on her way home from school and dumped in a field. In 2004, Denver police started a dedicated cold case crime unit. They began to look at the cases of all four women. In 2013, they got their first connection. DNA evidence collected Dolores and Madeline to the same killer. Two years later, in 2015, authorities could also connect Harris to that killer. 
and finally in 2018, Parks was added to the list of victims of the same assailant. In 2014, the Denver Police Department used genealogy DNA services to locate relatives of the killer in Texas. After working with Texas departments in 2021, they came up with a suspect, Joseph Michael Irvin. Additionally, they also discovered that he was wanted on a murder charge in Texas and had an extensive criminal history. In 1969, Irvin, who was 17 at the time, was at a local bowling alley when he and an unidentified friend walked up to a car of 21-year-old Rodney Bonham. Irvin asked Rodney and his passenger a question. The confrontation turned hostile and Irvin pulled a gun and shot Rodney in the neck. Irvin then asked the passenger if they could drive. The passenger then managed to close the door and run to the bowling alley to call for help. After four days in the hospital, Rodney Bonham died from the gunshot. Irvin is said to have called the family after Rodney had died, saying, quote, I'm sorry he's dead, but we all have to go sometime. I'm sorry I shot him, end quote. It is then believed that he had fled to Colorado. According to criminal records in Colorado, he had been arrested in 1970 for a slew of burglaries and sexual assaults, including the sexual assault of a 10-year-old girl. He was acquitted by reason of sanity and was sent to a mental hospital in Pueblo, Colorado, but was released on a conditional bail in 1977. Then, on June 27, 1981, Aurora PD officer, 26-year-old Deborah Sue Kaur, pulled over a man that she believed was intoxicated. She radioed in her location, the man's name, and license plate number, asking for help in the arrest. She was in the process of arresting the man when he managed to break free. There was a scuffle, and in the struggle, the man managed to get a hold of Deborah's service weapon. At this time, a local man named Glenn Spies was driving by and stopped to help. The suspect shot Deborah in the head and Glenn in the back before fleeing the scene. When police arrived, Deborah was declared deceased. Deborah had just completed her first year as an officer and was married to a fellow officer. This would be Aurora PD's first line of duty shooting and forever change the department's patrolling alone policy. Glenn was also rushed to the hospital where he was able to recover from his wounds. Unfortunately, the bullet exploded near his spine and it would cost him the ability to join the police force as he walked with a limp and lived in constant pain. In July 1981, the Aurora City Council awarded him $10,000 for his heroism and sacrifice. Police found the temporary driver's license of the man that Deborah had pulled over in her patrol vehicle and identified him as Joe Irwing. They went to his address and found Joe there trying to get off his handcuffs by sawing his wrist. Joe Irwing was arrested. Five days later, on July 1st, 1981, Joe Irwin, who at the time was 30 years old, hung himself while in solitary cell in Adams County Jail. He left a suicide note which said, quote, To the Denver community, I pray that I will be forgiven for taking up your time and for my sickening behavior. To the kid in the hospital and Miss Core, I didn't mean what I did. I was so uptight. Forgive me and it was signed Joe Irwin. After his arrest, police discovered that he was currently out on bail for sexual assault from 1980. After the suicide, police also discovered that there had been a mistake during his bail hearing. When putting his name into the computer database, authorities had put his birth year as 1952 when he was born in 1951. When police put the correct information into the database, Joe Irwin came up as an alias. His real name was Joseph Michael Everin, and he was wanted in connection to a murder in Texas, and finally connecting him to the four unsolved cold cases in Denver and the murdered police officer in Aurora. After exhausting all efforts to find a catalog piece of DNA from Irvin, Denver and Texas authorities petitioned the court to exhume his body and get a DNA sample. The courts approved the exhumation of Irving in 2022, 
and shortly after, the Denver Police Department officially announced that Irvin was a serial killer connected to the killings of these four women in Denver. After 40 years, the families and the Denver community have answers to these cold cases. Some of the family members had these statements to say after finding out. Well, I'd like to say this has taken a long time. We can finally have peace knowing who did this to my little sister. Uh, Me and my brother are the only remaining siblings of six children. I wore a shirt today in memory of all my siblings. And I lost these two sisters, they were the oldest. One in 2018 to a car wreck on First in Knox here in Denver. The second one died from heartbreak from the car wreck. Um, my, of course, you guys know my little sister Antoinette died in 81. And my little sister Rhonda, who was her, she passed last year, September 9th, to cancer. So with that being said, I'd like you guys to know We have closure. We're thankful for the hard work, determination of everybody involved here. I wish my sisters and my mom could all be here to see this. Fortunately, they didn't live long enough to see this, but I know they're here with us in spirit, and I want to say thank you guys for all coming to take the time to listen to us. Hello. My name is Carl, and... uh, you know, like my brother said, you know, it's been a long time coming, and now we can actually, you know, really rest better at night. Like I said, the rest of them, they're not here. But like I said, if my mom or my sister were here, but I know they are, because they're sitting high and looking low. And they're saying right now, hey, thank you guys, every last one of you, for everything. Anybody had anything to do with this, believe me, they're saying thank you, and God bless you all. Good morning. My sister Ariel and I wanted to take time today to express our gratitude to the Denver Police Department and all agencies and individuals involved over the years for all of the hard work and the sacrifice in solving this series of horrific crimes. We are here to talk about our mother, Madeline Fury Livide. She was a young woman with a very bright future. She was a writer, She had written for Nature magazines for years and had written and published a book. She was an ecologist with a passion for the natural world and the environment. She was a loving wife, sister, daughter, and mother to two very young girls. But in 1978, she had that bright future ripped away from her. Tragically, we didn't get to grow up with her and to hear her stories and to witness the contributions that she could have made to the world. It's been a lot of information to absorb so suddenly after all this time. We found out that this man murdered four more women and he assaulted an uncounted number of others. In addition, to learn about the line of duty death of Officer Deborah Sue Kaur has been personally very impactful. She was out doing her job when she attempted to arrest this serial killer for an unrelated crime. And in the course of his arrest, she was murdered herself. But with her sacrifice, she prevented him from killing anyone else. And it's clear that he wasn't gonna stop on his own. She stopped him, the police stopped him, back in 1981. And for that, for Officer Corps' sacrifice of her life, we are thankful. Finally, I would like to reflect on how the Denver Police Department has proven today that it won't stop hunting for the predators among us. For us citizens who are, like my mother was, just home feeding our children breakfast, or walking to the bus stop, or home from school, for us, the DPD cold case unit and the Denver crime lab and the Denver DA's office had said, have said, you're not gonna get away with it. We're gonna find you. And for that, we are here today to say thank you. It is a great relief to our family 
to finally have this resolution and to know that they never stopped working towards that goal for us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sisters are all out of town and asked me to extend this statement on their behalf. So on behalf of Eileen Fury Roy, Tess Fury, and Megan Fury Kinney, Madeline had a vibrant and curious spirit. She was fearlessly adventurous and loved traveling as part of her job as an editor of the children's magazine, Ranger Rick. She loved learning. Every elementary school report card had a notation saying something like, excellent student, but talks too much. Madeline was fun and she delighted in her daughters, Molly and baby Ariel. She was a romantic who loved her life, but when her daughters were born, she was over the moon. One sweet memory we have is that she used to sing to her girls the song Stevie Wonder wrote when his daughter was born, Isn't She Lovely? She could never have imagined leaving them. It is an unmitigated tragedy that they never got to know their creative and talented mother. Madeline was loved and admired by her family and all who knew her. We will never stop missing her. Denver PD are currently going through old cold cases and looking for additional victims of sexual assault or murder and believe Irving had more victims that are currently unknown. While it is bittersweet to not have justice in this case, hopefully the victims and their families can rest easier knowing that this predator isn't here anymore to hurt anyone else. Good afternoon and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. Today we're discussing a serial killer from Wales that has recently been identified, solving the cold case murders from the killer previously known as the Saturday Night Strangler. Let's get into it. It was September of 1973 in Neath, Wales, a quaint community eight miles outside of the city of Swansea, when the bodies of two 16-year-old girls, Geraldine Hughes and Pauline Floyd, were found in the early morning hours dumped in a wooded area near their homes. The girls had been hitchhiking from a nightclub in the city of Swansea around 1.30 a.m. on September 1st, but the girls never made it home that night. The girls had been picked up and despite what should have been a short drive home, the girls were driven to a grove of trees near where they lived. There, Geraldine and Pauline were both sexually assaulted, then apparently allowed to redress as indicated by dirt and debris on the soles of their feet and inside their tights. They were both killed within yards of each other, sustaining head wounds and strangulation marks. It was determined that strangulation by rope was the cause of their deaths. How their killer managed to control and murder both girls simultaneously is unknown and likely never will be. The homicides left two families grief-stricken and the local community afraid and outraged. To make matters worse, this was not the only recent murder of a local teenage girl. Just a few months earlier, in July of 1973, 16-year-old Sandra Newton had been found dead in Neath, her body dumped in a culvert near the mountain roadway. Like Geraldine and Pauline, Sandra had been hitchhiking home from a nearby nightclub when she was picked up, sexually assaulted, and strangled to death with the hem of her chiffon skirt. Since all of the girls had been hitchhiking when they were picked up and killed, it's easy to look at a case like this from a modern perspective and wonder why such young girls would have been getting in a car with a strange man alone at night. But in the 1970s, hitchhiking was normal. It was part of the culture, even for young women. 
There also often wasn't another option. When the girls were going out, there weren't any buses running at 1 or 2 a.m., and none of the victims had cars of their own. Taxis also would have been much too expensive, so this really only left hitchhiking when going out miles from home. With the hitchhiking, the assaults, and the strangulation in common, the connection between the murders seemed obvious to local citizens, news outlets, and police at first, but became complicated by the fact that Sandra had a married boyfriend who she'd been out with the night of her murder, who seemed a likely suspect in her murder investigation. Her boyfriend claimed they'd walked home in opposite directions, and that was the last he saw of her on the night of her death. Suspicion was cast on him, but he didn't have a car or license, and since her body was found miles away from where they had last been together, he was eventually ruled out as a suspect. So an alleged connection between the murders was established once again. Following the murders of Geraldine and Pauline in September, the Welsh police quickly assembled a huge team to catch the man that local papers began to call the Saturday Night Strangler. Over 150 detectives were dispatched to go door to door to see if anyone saw anything suspicious on the night of the murders. This case was about to become the largest murder inquiry in Welsh history. In 1973, when the investigation was just beginning, the term serial killer had not yet been coined. Little was known about this type of repeat killer. The personality or motivations of serial killers were not understood, and criminal profiling and psychology were fairly new concepts. It would take another 10 years before DNA evidence would first be used in a criminal trial. Therefore, the police understandably had little to go on, with the exception of one lead, a white car. Passing drivers had reported seeing this vehicle parked near Pauline and Geraldine's murder site between 1.45 to 2.15 a.m. on September 16th. Similarly, others had reported a similar same color, make, and model of the car going like the clappers, or very fast, in Neath at the time of Sandra's murder. They narrowed down the make and model based on witness statements to likely be a white Austin 1100, which at the time was an incredibly common vehicle. It had been Britain's best-selling car for almost a decade, with over a million vehicles sold in the UK. The police felt confident that their killer would own, or at least have been using that car. So they went right down the list of registrations, questioning anyone in the area who owned a white Austin 1100 car. The result was thousands of names that led to hundreds of interviews and an overwhelming amount of suspects and information. Police simply checked each Austin 1100 owner for an alibi and crossed each name off a list. There were so many people to comb through that the killer could have easily avoided suspicion and slipped through the cracks. And slipped through, he did. After several years without new information, the case went cold. It would be nearly three decades before new information gave the case any real traction and warranted its reopening. In the meantime, the families and communities were left without answers. In 2001, forensic science had really advanced to a point that the girl's clothing could be tested for DNA evidence. The girl's clothing was removed from an evidence box that had spent decades in sterile storage. Full DNA profiles were able to be pulled from the clothing articles that had been worn by Pauline and Sandra. Samples from the two cases could be tested against one another, hopefully proving that the murders were committed by the same person. DNA taken from the two separate crime scenes were exact matches, finally showing that these three deaths had been the work of a single serial killer. This new evidence was compelling enough to reopen the case. Detectives began scouring the national databases for a match using the new DNA evidence. While they weren't able to find an exact match, they did find a near match, which likely belonged to a relative of the killer. The similar DNA was that of Paul Cappen, a local car thief, which led back to a man who had been questioned for owning a white Austin 1100 as part of the initial investigation in 1973. His name was Joseph Cappen, and he was now suspect number one. Joseph Cappen was a local to the Neath area. 
He had been born in Port Talbot in 1941, going on to live there his whole life. Those who knew Capon described him as a man of violent disposition. As early as the age of 12, Capon had come to the attention of the police. By the time the murders were committed, he had a record of more than 30 criminal offenses, including robbing gas meters, car theft, burglary, and assault. He was frequently in and out of prison, and he had never been able to hold down a job for long, but worked as a bus driver and a bouncer at local clubs on and off, giving Capon the unique opportunity to commit the murders. He could have followed the teens right from the club. Capon's ex-wife, Christine, is partially to blame for why he was overlooked. She provided his alibi on the nights of the murder. Joseph and Christine Capon had met when he was 20 and she was 17. They married quickly after Christine discovered she was pregnant with their first child. Their 18-year marriage got off to a rough start when Joseph Capon was sent to prison for three years for breaking into houses and robbing gas meters 10 days into their married life. But even when he got out of prison and became a father of two, it was never a happy household. Money was always tight since Capon couldn't hold down a job, and they barely made ends meet with his short-lived gigs. Christine also admitted to thinking it was normal for men to hit their wives. In an interview, Christine said, I thought all men were violent. He used to sexual assault me every two weeks. It was against my will. I never wanted it. Joe would say, come on, come on, and then he would insist on his conjugal rights. In one incident, Capon terrified his son Paul when he was just a child. While they were walking a beach, they found a dog. Capon decided it was too old and proceeded to pick up a wire and strangle the dog in front of his son. This was also around the same time that the murders were being committed. When the police came knocking in 1973 to inquire about the murders, Christine had not put two and two together. She was young and naive and did not believe her husband was capable of murder. Furthermore, because Capon was always committing petty crimes, Christine had learned to agree with him if the police showed up at the house. So, like she often had, she alibied him for the night of the murders, and the police checked him off their list. Three years went by before the DNA evidence had landed Capon back on the police radar and made him their top suspect in 2002, yet another obstacle stood in the way of the killer being brought to justice. Capon had died of lung cancer at only 48 years old in 1990. Though Capon could never be punished for ending the lives of the three young women, the police hoped they could still find a way to prove his guilt and bring a sense of finality and peace to the families of the victims. In 2003, police found a way to do just that when they received permission to exhume Capon's body, extract a sample of his DNA, and test it against the samples found on the girls. When they did so, they received the answer they had been looking for and finally proved that Joseph Capon was the man who sexually assaulted and killed Sandra Newton, Geraldine Hughes, and Pauline Floyd in July and September of 1973. Capon was the first person to be identified after death as a serial killer through familial DNA profiling. The conclusion of this case was not only a milestone in DNA profiling, but it brought answers to the three families of the girls who had never thought they would live to see their daughter's killer identified. Geraldine Hughes's father said of he and his wife, We have relived what Geraldine must have gone through every night for nearly 30 years. Now we know for certain who killed our daughter, and we can finally find some peace. We took flowers to Geraldine's grave and had a few quiet words with her, and we felt we had put her to rest properly. In addition to the murders in 1973, Capon is also being investigated for the murder of Maureen Malky, who was aged 23 and was strangled and killed in 1976. There were also several sexual assaults in areas he lived in and worked in that are being investigated to see if there's a connection. Joseph Capon had been Wales' first serial killer. Cold case detective Dr. Colin Dark said in a statement to media, After all these years of questions, suppositions, and heartaches to the girls' families. We got our man at last.
Hello everyone and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today we're discussing the capture of who is believed to be one of the most prolific serial killers in United States history. Let's get into it. In 2019, the FBI confirmed that Samuel Little was one of the most prolific serial killers in U.S. history. Samuel's confessions would mount up to 93 victims, many of which are still unidentified today. According to a report issued by the FBI, Samuel has been conclusively linked to at least 50 cases, and the others are still awaiting analysis results. His crimes and startling confessions shocked the world. How could one man be so depraved, and what had caused him to turn down this dark path? Samuel Little, birth name Samuel McDowell, was born on June 7, 1940 in Reynolds, Georgia. From the outset, Samuel's life was marred with tragedy and hardships. His grandmother was primarily responsible for his care, and shortly after he was born, they picked up and moved to Lorraine, Ohio. According to Samuel, whose story needs to be taken with a pinch of salt, his mother, Bessie May Little, was just 16 when she gave birth to him. Samuel told investigators that Bessie was a sex worker who all but abandoned him and left him to be brought up by his grandmother. Not much is known about Samuel's father, Paul McDowell, who was 19 when he was born. As Samuel grew up, the cracks began to show. His grandmother tried to control Samuel, but something inside awakened. During his childhood, Samuel developed a fetish for strangulation and true crime. In interviews with the FBI, Samuel recalled one of the first times he became aroused. He claimed it had happened during kindergarten when he witnessed a teacher touching her neck. After this, the seed was planted in Samuel's mind, and he began to pursue darker things. He claimed that at first photographs and his imagination were enough to get him by, but as he got older and his sexual urges became stronger, Samuel craved more. As a result of his bad and unruly behavior, he found himself at a boys' industrial school in Columbus, Ohio. This was a reform school that was supposed to straighten out young boys on the wrong path. Reform school had little effect on Samuel, and after spending a year and a half there, he was released back to the care of his grandmother. By 1956, Samuel found himself at the mercy of the law once more. This time, he had committed a robbery in Omaha, Nebraska, and had broken into a business in Lorraine. For his crime, Samuel Little once again found himself in a reformery, and this time it was the Ohio State Reformery in Mansfield. Many of you may recognize this as the location for the Shawshank Redemption. Unfortunately, the film ranks true to the levels of cruelty inflicted upon prisoners. Samuel's time in prison did little to reform him, as the name of the institution suggested. He only became angrier with the world and sought revenge. When released from prison, Samuel discovered that his criminal record and bad reputation made employment difficult. After bouncing between different institutions and finally being freed, Samuel turned to what he knew best, crime. Detective Darren Vesiga of the Pascagoula Police Department told the Cleveland Metro his whole thing was shoplifting. He would work at shoplifting in a city for three or four days, then move on. He would take the items to drug areas and sell them. Once he was done, he would go out in the early morning hours looking for women. Then in January 1971, everything changed for Samuel. His transient lifestyle had taken him across 26 states, and he had picked up arrests and charges in most of them. When he arrived in Miami Beach, he found himself surrounded by beautiful women. Samuel's hatred and rage for his mother boiled over. In January 1971, the body of an unknown woman was discovered in a shallow grave in the Florida Everglades. Investigators were horrified by what they found. She had been beaten and strangled before being tossed into the grave. Her body was an insignificant level of decay, and they were unable to make an identification at the time. The case was quickly deemed a homicide, but the investigators found themselves at a dead end without a victim's name or the perpetrator's name. This woman would remain nameless until 2017, when she was finally identified as 33-year-old Mary Brosley, thanks to the help of dental records. However, it would take few more years for Samuel Little to be connected to her case but he also had mentioned her in his confession upon his arrest. Throughout the 70s, Samuel Little moved from town to town, state to state, looking for victims. 
According to reports, Samuel had teamed up with Aurelia Jean Dorsey, an expert shoplifter. During the day, the two would steal whatever they could get their hands on, and at night, Samuel would go out looking for vulnerable women to attack and kill. In his confession, Samuel Little admitted to attacking hundreds of women, many whose names he didn't know. On September 11, 1976, Samuel began to escalate once more. A 911 call was placed to the police in the Sunset Hills, Missouri by a terrified Pamela K. Smith. When the police arrived at the scene, she explained how Samuel Little had tied her up with an electrical cord and then choked her with that electrical cord. She was forced into Samuel's car, where she was beaten and sexually assaulted. Disturbingly, Samuel Little was sentenced to just three months for this attack, despite the severity of it. The Star advertiser reported that Samuel may have gotten off lightly due to Pamela K. Smith being a known drug user. Within society and true crime, there are groups of people who were known as the less dead. These groups include people of color, indigenous people, people who abuse substances, sex workers, and anyone else who may be considered to be living a high-risk lifestyle. The society holds such a disregard for these groups of people when something happens to them. Nobody cares. This disregard is institutionalized and affects how police and other agencies handle their cases. This was all used to Samuel Little's advantage. In October 1982, the remains of a missing 22-year-old Melinda LaPree were found discovered in a cemetery in Goutier, Mississippi. Like many of Samuel Little's victims, Melinda was a sex worker who had been last seen getting into a brown, wood-paneled station wagon. Samuel would often lure sex workers into his car, where he would beat them, strangle them, sexually assault them, and dump their bodies like trash. This time, somebody realized that Melinda was missing, and investigators actively investigated her case when her remains were discovered. All signs pointed back to Samuel Little, but unfortunately, he was never convicted in this crime. The Star Advertiser reported that much of the evidence and the original case files were washed away during Hurricane Katrina. Just a month before the discovery of Melinda's body, Officers in Forest Grove, Florida, around 420 miles from Gutier, discovered the body of 26-year-old Patricia Ann Mount. Patricia had a mental disability, and she too had last been seen getting into a brown wood-paneled station wagon. Multiple witnesses were able to confirm that Patricia had been at the bar with Samuel Little that night, and fibers had been lifted from Patricia's clothes, proving that Samuel had been in contact with her. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to convict a grand jury to indict Samuel, and he was once again free. There were many opportunities in this case to stop Samuel Little. Dozens of women reported their attacks perpetuated by him, but nobody listened to them. If they did listen, it rarely ever resulted in a conviction or arrest. They were left to bear the physical and psychological scars. Another one of these opportunities came in November 1984, when San Diego Police Department pulled him over and found an unconscious woman in the passenger seat. She had been beaten and strangled, and Samuel desperately tried to talk his way out of the situation. Prosecutors across the country were becoming accustomed to the name Samuel Little, or Samuel McDowell as he was sometimes known. Police officers who discovered the strangled woman testified at a trial, and this wasn't the only trial he was being tried for. Just a month earlier, in October 1984, he had been suspected of assaulting and strangling 22-year-old Laura Barrows. Incredibly, Lori, like Pamela, had survived her attack, but justice would not be swift. Other sources report that Samuel was acquitted in one of the two cases, whilst others report that the jury was deadlocked and they were unable to decide his guilt. In terms of the other cases where Samuel was charged with false imprisonment, attempted murder and assault, he was found guilty and sentenced to serve a disgustingly short two and a half years. By 1987, Samuel Little was once again free to roam the streets, looking for more victims. In his interviews with the FBI, he admitted that following his release, he moved to Los Angeles and killed at least another 10 women there. Samuel's house of cards would slowly start to fall down around him in the mid-2000s. 
In August 2005, the body of Nancy C. Stevens was found on the side of the road in Tupelo, Mississippi. She bore all the hallmarks of Samuel Little, and investigators were now becoming wise to Little's pathology. In 2007, Samuel was arrested once again, this time for the possession of an illicit substance, and he was ordered to go to rehab. When Samuel failed to appear, the warrant for his arrest was issued, and in 2012, investigators decided to run his DNA through CODIS, the combined DNA index system that is used nationally. Incredibly, Samuel Little's DNA came back as a hit to three crime scenes that were cold. Carol Alford murdered in 1987, Audrey Nelson murdered in 1989, and Guadalupe Arapaga murdered in 1989. Investigators feared that Samuel had been involved in many more cases than these, and were eager to track him down. According to Oxygen, investigators in LA followed Samuel's social security payments, leading him to a homeless shelter in Louisville, Kentucky. The life of crime had not served Samuel well. By the time of his arrest in 2012, he was 72 years old. Investigators felt that they had hit the jackpot in arresting Samuel Little. Unbeknownst to them, their suspect would become the most prolific U.S. serial killer in just a few years. At his trial for the murders of Carol Alford, Audrey Nelson, Guadalupe Arapaca, Samuel maintained his innocence, but he couldn't get away with it this time. DNA and forensic technologies had advanced significantly since the 1980s, and Samuel's DNA was found all over the bodies and the crime scenes. It took the jury a matter of days to find Samuel Little guilty on all counts. He was sentenced to life without parole. Samuel's case made headlines across LA and California, but in five years Samuel Little would become known once again. Behind the scenes, investigators desperately tried to track Samuel's movements throughout his entire life. Sources indicate that they created a 24-page document that detailed a timeline of Samuel's movements from the day he was born to the day he was arrested. He had been arrested over 50 times in 24 states for crimes ranging from petty theft and burglary all the way up to attempted murder and false imprisonment. Investigators knew that Samuel's transient lifestyle had given him an advantage when it came to picking up women and being able to disappear without a trace. Samuel was eventually linked to numerous cases across the U.S., many of which the victims still remain unidentified. In 2018, Texas Ranger James Holland requested an interview with Samuel Little, and in a shocking turn of events, Samuel granted it. As James Holland and FBI analysis Christy Palazzo and Angela Williamson sat down in front of a shackled Samuel Little, they had no idea what to expect. They knew that Samuel's M.O. was to beat and strangle sex workers before leaving their bodies to be discovered, but they had no idea just how large his victim pool was. Samuel had maintained his innocence for years, but in 2018, he was finally ready to talk. As previously stated, many of Samuel's victims were unidentified, and Samuel himself could not provide investigators with information about many of his victims. But what he could do was draw them. Over the course of a few years, Samuel Little created drawings of his victims, showing what they looked like shortly before he took their lives. These drawings are haunting to look at, knowing that these women remained unidentified and unclaimed. Samuel recalled in one drawing that he met a transient African-American woman in North Little Rock between 1992 and 1994. Samuel drew what the woman looked like and described her as black, around 24 years old, 5'5 to 5'7 and 200 pounds. He told investigators that he drove Jane Doe to a secluded area, strangled her with his bare hands, and then covered her body with branches and corn stalks. Another drawing depicts a 25-year-old white woman White short blonde hair, blue eyes, 5'7", between 130 to 170 pounds. Little told investigators that he met this woman somewhere between Lorraine, Ohio, and Cincinnati. The two drove into the city, spent some time together before Samuel took her down a dirt road and strangled her and left her body at the top of a hill. During his many interviews, Samuel told the investigators that he avoided those that he knew would be immediately missed. He also said, quote, I'd go back to the same city sometimes to pluck me another grape. How many grapes do y'all got on the vine here? 
I'm not going to go over there and into the white neighborhood and pick out a little teenage girl. Of the 93 crimes that Samuel Little has confessed to, at least 50 to 60 have been verified by law enforcement and confirmed to be his. Several women remain nameless, and the FBI is asking for help. You're asked to contact your local FBI office if you recognize any of these women depicted in Samuel's sketches. There are also these cases where Samuel's involvement has not yet been confirmed and he remains a suspect. Law enforcement agencies across the U.S. are endeavoring to analyze and test all evidence collected from the crime scenes to determine Samuel's involvement. Samuel Little was arrested to serve life in prison, but at 72 years old at the time of his arrest, many thought that it was too little too late. On December 30th, 2020, eight-year-old Samuel Little passed away in Los Angeles Hospital. Samuel's official cause of death has never been released, although people have speculated that it is related to ongoing heart problems and diabetes. Whilst another monster has finally been snuffed out, he leaves a trail of destruction behind him, unidentified women, grieving families, and victims looking for answers. Hello everyone and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today we're discussing the recent capture of a California serial killer, Wesley Brownlee. Let's get into it. From July to September 2022 in Stockton, California, it would see a series of shootings that would eventually be tied to the work of a serial killer. On July 8, 2022, the Stockton police responded to a shooting at 12.31 a.m. in a park on the 5600 block of Kermit Lane. The victim would be rushed to the hospital, but would die of his injuries. He was later identified as 35-year-old Paul Alexander Yaw. In a statement to the press, his mother, Greta Bogro, said, quote, This is my son, Paul. He was a great man with a big heart. He was my son, a father, a grandson, a nephew cousin and brother and was loved by many he has left a huge hole in our hearts and i hope to catch the person responsible before this happens again over a month later the police would respond to shots fired on august 11th at 9 49 p.m in a popeye's restaurant parking lot on the 4900 block of west lane the 43-year-old man, later identified as Salvador William de Bude Jr., would be pronounced dead at the scene. His wife, Annalita Lopez, is quoted saying, To be honest with you, a part of me died with him that day, Lopez said. It's been hard. It's been really, really hard. On August 30th, they would see the next shooting on the 800 block of E. Hammer Lane at 6.41 a.m., Police responded and found a 21-year-old man in his car. He was pronounced dead at the scene. He was identified as Jonathan Rodriguez Hernandez. Jonathan's mother set up a memorial near where he died with a message that said, I will always love you and remember you for the love that you always had for us, your parents. You didn't deserve your life to be taken this way. You were always good and a kind child to everyone around you, and they all loved you. I, your mother, am mostly heartbroken and will always miss you with my heart and soul. Your Mammy, as you always called me. On September 21st at 4.27 a.m., Stockton police responded to shots fired on the 4400 block of Manchester Avenue. They identified a man on the sidewalk. First responders attempted life-saving measures, but he was pronounced dead at the scene and was later identified as 52-year-old Juan Carlos Carranza Cruz. Less than a week later, on September 27th, the police would respond to a shooting at 1.51 a.m. on the 900 block of Porter Avenue. A 54-year-old man was found again on the sidewalk. Life-saving measures were taken, but the man again died at the scene. The man, Lawrence Lopez, was described as a father of six, and his sister is quoted as saying, My brother was everything, and I'm never going to hear his laughter. 
The Stockton Police Department posted on Facebook on September 30th that they believe that all of these shootings were connected to the same person. They'd reviewed hours of video surveillance from around the shootings and posted a picture of a suspect. The suspect was wearing all dark colors and you could not see the person's face. The police also released a map of the shootings. So right now, Stockton police believe that a potential serial killer has now been active since April of this year. Two new victims have been identified. And one of the victims died. The other did survive. The gunman shot both of them in the early morning hours. This now brings the total to seven. So the message uh, is police that time and time again are repeating, as we just heard, please don't panic. But the Stockton Police Department says it is baffled by this string of killings. All right, Devin Truby is standing by now with more on the why and a lot of questions left unanswered. Devin, good morning to you. Good morning, Walt, and they are baffled because Stockton police says they do not know why these individuals were targeted. There's no motivation right now in terms of drugs or even gang activity. In fact, the only thing connecting all of these people right now is the fact that they were attacked when they were alone and when it was dark outside and these two new victims that we now know about police are working to confirm to find out if that matches if they were also alone during the time that they were targeted but still waiting for that information the age of all, all these individuals is also very broad anywhere from 20 to 50 years old four of them were hispanic men one was a white man authorities releasing a very grainy still image of a person that appears in videos at multiple crime scenes calling this person dressed in all black in a black ball cap who's tall and slender a person of interest at this time police saying the alleged serial killer is very bold and very brazen and we spoke with one of the victim's family members on the discovery that this may now be the work of a serial killer they were all killed late at night or early in the morning always when it was dark out the men were always alone and there were no witnesses on october 3rd the stockton police would announce another connection from 2021 they would connect two shootings from 2021, one on April 10th of a Hispanic man identified by his family as Miguel Vasquez. He was 40 years old and was shot in Oakland, California at 4.18 a.m. He was found on the sidewalk and died at the scene. The second shooting would be the only survivor of this killer. Her name is Natasha Latour, and she was shot on April 16th. Natasha was unhoused, living in a tent on the corner of Park and Union Street in Stockton. She has since been interviewed, saying that she heard someone outside her tent, she got out to investigate, she saw a figure wearing dark clothing and a black medical-looking mask obscuring his face. The assailant pointed a gun at her and started shooting. Natasha didn't have anywhere to run, so she rushed her attacker. When she did, he got down on one knee with both hands on the gun and continued to shoot. She was shot multiple times, and the person said nothing to her and just walked away. This occurred at 3.20 a.m. She was found by a good Samaritan who called 911. Natasha said in an interview that she felt after the attack, the police didn't listen to her and that they thought it was a drug deal gone wrong, and that after getting out of the hospital, it was her that had to go to contact the police about her attack. She was quoted in the interview saying, Five people died because they didn't listen to me. All the families have asked for privacy and time while they process everything that has happened. All seven cases have been connected with ballistic evidence. Police have not released any more information on how they know they are connected. In a press release on October 15th, the Stockton Police Department announced that they had arrested a suspect in a series of killings. The SPD said in a statement regarding the arrest, quote, We can only provide limited information for the integrity of the investigation. Just because an arrest was made does not mean that the investigation stops. So we want to thank our partners in law enforcement, Stockton Police Department, Chief McFadden, thank you, Catherine Nass, Stager, all of them who have worked, their detectives, officers on the street, who have worked so hard and dedicated themselves to ensuring the arrest and apprehension of this suspect. We've worked with fellow local, state, and federal agencies who assisted in the capture of this suspect, Wesley Brownlee. I want to thank District Attorney Ron Freitas elect, Chief James Boyko from the Bureau of Investigations and a marvelous team of him from my office. I'm supervising Deputy District Attorney Caitlin Casey, Deputy District Attorneys Janet Smith and Elton Grau, 
for their hard work and dedication, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, on this case and all the other cases that they handle. They're the most ethical, professional, hardworking people you could have the privilege of working with. The city of Stockton, all of their resources were made available during the course of this investigation. So thank you, city manager. We appreciate that. ATF um, and our business community, our spiritual community, I couldn't go five feet in this community where people weren't saying prayers that we find this individual and prayers for the survivors and families that have been so terribly harmed by this crime, these crimes. I want to thank all of them, also those who contributed to the award amount. In conjunction with Stockton Police Department, the San Joaquin County District Attorney's Office is, to committed, to, is committed to ensuring the safety of our community. My administration has been working around the clock to providing any necessary resources that the Stockton Police Department would need during the course of this investigation into these tragic killings. My deputy district attorneys, who have been here all night, are reviewing the evidence as we speak, and they're working actively in partnership with the investigation to determine the charges that we'll proceed on. The defendant, because I'm no longer ever going to say his name again, because he doesn't deserve to have a name. He doesn't deserve to be out there. So the defendant is what we're going to call him from now on. The defendant will have charges, will be arraigned in court on Tuesday afternoon at 1.30. At that point, after the arraignment, we'll have a press conference announcing the charges and discussing those charges further with you. This is a very fluid and ongoing investigation. So we will most likely be adding charges, but at this time, we have to bring him before a magistrate within 48 hours. That clock's running now, so we have until Tuesday to bring him in. We'll arraign him at that time, and then we'll proceed to continue to assist with the investigation and also assist in healing our community. Our Family Justice Center, our doors are open, our victim witness services are available, and we're here to help. This crime was solved because we're Stocktonians. Because you don't come to our house and bring this kind of reign of terror and not mobilize 350,000 people, 780,000 in this whole entire county, mobilized, mobilized, and captured this individual who reign of terror is no longer. So I want to thank San Joaquin County and particularly the city of Stockton, community members, activists, people in our faith-based community, businesses, our law enforcement, our prosecution, and now we'll be rolling into the court. Thank them all for this opportunity to really bring home justice for these victims. We now have to have a successful prosecution for our victims and their families. For the last two days, I have met with our victims' families. I can't go into our conversations, but our talks have been very emotional and they want justice. They also stated that it was a combination of community tips and good old-fashioned police work that they were able to zero in on a possible suspect. They said, quote, We watched his patterns and determined early this morning he was on a mission to kill. He was out hunting. He was stopped by our team in the area of the Village Green Drive and Winslow Avenue around 2 a.m. this morning. When police arrested the suspect, he was wearing all dark clothing with a mask around his neck, and he was armed with a handgun. The arrested 43-year-old Wesley Brownlee. Brownlee was born in San Francisco, but grew up most of his life in Oakland in an apartment only six blocks from the April attacks. In the 90s, he moved with his family to Stockton. His parents were together on and off for years, but they split when Brownlee was in his teens. It is reported that he was accused of sexual assault while he was a teenager along with two other boys and denied any involvement blaming the assault on the other boys. Also, according to records, he has been arrested multiple times for selling illicit substances in Oakland. In October of 1995, the Oakland Tribune reported that his brother, Dale Brownlee, had been shot and killed in the streets of his old neighborhood in Oakland while visiting friends. The report at the time believed it was a drug-related killing. There's no information on if anyone was ever charged for his brother's killing. Mercury News reported that a probation document had stated that Brownlee apparently suffered both innate mental limitation and psychological stress over his brother's 1995 shooting death. Quote, he seems either unable or unwilling to assume meaningful responsibility for himself. He appears to have difficulty settling into any kind of positive activity. Brownlee never completed high school, having dropped out when he was a junior. 
He's been convicted several times. None of his convictions were for violent crimes. Brownlee seems to have had a very troubled youth and never managed to get his life on the right path. Police have reported that Brownlee had used a ghost gun in some of the shootings. We covered ghost guns pretty extensively during the Nancy Brophy case, but essentially ghost guns are unregulated firearms that anyone, including minors and prohibited purchasers, can buy and build without a background check. Ghost guns are unserialized and untraceable firearms that can be bought online and assembled at home. A neighbor of Brownlee has reported that he was quiet and kept to himself, and that he had lived with his mother on and off over the past few years. Police reported that they currently can't find a motive for why Brownlee would start killing in his early 40s. They do believe that he would have continued killing if he had not been arrested. Though five of the victims were Hispanic and four were unhoused, authorities do not believe that race or situation had any motives for the killings, that he was killing opportunistically. They believe that Brownlee was hunting for victims that were alone or easy to come up upon. After his arrest in October, Brownlee was held without bail. On October 18th, Wesley was charged with three of the six shootings he is believed to have committed. He was charged with the deaths of Hernandez in the August 30th shooting, Cruz in the September 21st shooting, and Lopez shot September 27th. Since October, Brownlee has had multiple arraignments and has had his most recent one postponed to January 2023. He has not put in a plea and is being defended by a public defender. In October, Brownlee's legal team argued for a publicity gag order, saying that recent news reports and press coverage of conferences were hurting their client's chance at a fair trial, that he had been depicted as guilty of serial killings before the trial had even begun. The judge denied the gag order, stating that the press conference was stating facts of what happened and the arrest, as well as quoted saying, my ruling in no way condones some of the inflammatory statements made by the press, but I would urge parties to keep their issues in mind when speaking to the press going forward. Authorities have said that the investigation has not stopped, they are still looking for more evidence in this case, and that more charges may come for Brownlee in 2023. At this time, Brownlee is being held in custody while he awaits trial. So far, he faces three counts of murder, possession of a firearm, and ammunition. He faces life in prison if convicted, or the death penalty. As always, please leave a comment down below if you want me to keep following this case to trial, or give updates as this progresses. Hello everyone and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today we're discussing three more solved cold cases. Let's get into it. Number 1. Stacy Lynn Chahorsky On the morning of December 16, 1988, two state transportation workers found the body of a very decomposed woman on the side of the Interstate 59 in Dade County, Georgia, close to the Alabama border. By that afternoon, authorities, including the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, arrived at the crime scene. The JBI found no identification on or around the body. They would try fingerprinting with no results. There was very little evidence found at the scene. However, they did find one piece of evidence that may have the killer's DNA on it. It would be saved, as there was not much they could do with evidence of this type in 1988. The JBI believed this woman may have been a hitchhiker who was picked up and then eventually dumped on the side of the road. Her body would have been there for days, if not weeks, before it had been found. She was believed to have been 20 to 25 years old, 125 pounds, and 5 foot 7 tall. She had been wearing an extra large navy blue thermal knit sweater, Calvin Klein blue jeans, a navy blue bra, and ankle high black boots. She had worn a gold chain around her neck and a white gold heart shaped ring on her left pinky finger. After an autopsy, it was discovered that she had been sexually assaulted before her death and had died from strangulation. Her death was ruled a homicide. The unknown woman would eventually be called Rising Fawn Jane Doe. They would try over the years to make updated sketches and clay renderings of what they believed Rising Jane Doe looked like in the hopes of identifying her. Authorities could not identify the Rising Jane Doe for three decades. 
In the mid-2000s, the case was reassigned. These new JBI investigators would find additional evidence that they could send to the FBI for further testing. They would be able to get a DNA profile of rising fawn Jane Doe and enter it to the missing person database. Unfortunately, they would not get a match. In 2015, rising fawn Jane Doe's case was reassigned, this time to the JBI cold case unit. It was at this time they would be able to make new clay renderings and composite images of the victim. A social media campaign was undertaken, but again, it did not lead to any positive identification. In March 2022, the JBI and FBI announced that they had finally identified this woman using genetic genealogy. They announced in a press conference that her name was Stacy Lynn Chahorsky. Stacy had been reported missing by her mother in January 1989 from Michigan. Stacy was on a hitchhiking trip through the southern states in the fall of 1988. Her mother had reported her missing after she did not come home for Christmas as planned. Stacy was only 19 when she died. Stacy's mother has since identified the jewelry that was found with Stacy, and her remains have been sent to Michigan. And the case doesn't end there. In September, the JBI and FBI announced in a press conference that they identified Stacy's killer using the same genetic genealogy, making this the first case in Georgia where a victim and killer were identified with the same technology. Stacy's killer was identified as Henry Frederick Haas Wise. Wise was a truck driver who worked a route in the area driving through Chattanooga to Birmingham to Nashville. Wise was also a stunt driver, and in 1999, he died in a stunt car accident. He burned to death. He had a criminal history in several states, which included theft, assault, and obstruction of a police officer. His arrests all predated mandatory DNA testing for felony arrests. On September 6, 2022, the JBI press release stated this, quote, Mary Beth Smith, Stacy Jaworski's mother, expresses gratitude to the FBI, the JBI, Special Agent Adam James for his relentless pursuit of this case, and JBI forensic artist Marla Lawson for her work on the composite drawings and clay renderings. She also thanks Dade County Sheriff Ray Cross, all the people in Dade County who took care of Stacy as she was brought home to Norton Shores, Michigan, and the Norton Shores Police Department for never giving up on finding her. With very little evidence, the investigators in this case never stopped looking for answers. Number 2. Joette Smith On March 29, 1983, a man was walking his dog on the banks of the San Lorenzo River on the 200 block of Woodland Drive in Ben Lamont, California, when he saw a body floating in the river. She only wore one nylon, a black boot, and a string of pearls. A navy blue cape was found nearby. Sheriff's deputies arrived at the crime scene, finding several other pieces of evidence. They quickly identified the woman as Joette Marie Smith. She was 33 and the owner of a popular local restaurant called Buffalo Gals. Joette was described as a remarkable woman, very hospitable, happy, cordial, a woman just full of vigor. She was always there when people needed her. She was last seen on March 28, 1983. Joette closed up the restaurant for the night and went across the street to her studio apartment, which she was sharing with a friend, Rachel Devereaux, at the time. Rachel would stay and work with Joette in the winter months as her 46-acre property would be inaccessible during the winter rainy seasons. The two women watched the TV show Thunderbirds, ate some popcorn before Joette made some phone calls. Joette said she was tired and Rachel went to bed. Rachel woke up at 3 a.m. to find Joette not in the apartment. This was not unusual, as Joette often went to the restaurant late at night. Detectives would find out that Joette had left the apartment and walked to a local bar to buy cigarettes. She had tried one shop closer to home, but it was closed. So she had walked to Henfling's Inn, a bar in downtown Ben Lamont. A waitress there who knew Joette had offered her a ride home, but she said it was a lovely night and she wanted to walk. That would be the last known sighting of Joette alive. Detectives believe she might have been stopped on the bridge, which was on her way home. An autopsy would show that she'd been strangled to death and that there may have been a sexual element which they haven't released. Her death was ruled a homicide. There was not much for authorities to go on. They interviewed everyone in Joette's life, talked to people who saw her that night, and came up with nothing. 
Everyone they spoke to didn't think that Joette had any enemies. Authorities had physical evidence, but nothing to compare it to, and DNA testing was not being used yet. Joette had moved to Ben Lamont 10 years before and had been about to celebrate the 8th anniversary of owning the restaurant, and she had been planning a big anniversary celebration. She had moved from Colorado Springs, but had attended college in Kansas. She was originally from Omaha, Nebraska, where her family still resided. Her mother brought her remains back to Nebraska, where she now rests. There would be no leads in her case until 1988, when detectives would have a suspect, a man named Eric David Drummond. He had an extensive criminal history in California and Nevada, which included sexual assault. Detectives would learn that Drummond had asked Joette out on a date and she told him no. Drummond had left California quickly after the murder. They had circumstantial evidence connecting him to the crime, but no case could be brought against him without more physical evidence. Joette's case would eventually go cold. In 2022, her case was reopened in the hopes of using new DNA technology not available in 1983. They were able to get a male DNA sample from the 1983 evidence. In August of 2022, they were able to get a sample of DNA directly from Drummond, now 64 years old. The DNA sample was an exact match for the evidence sample. Unfortunately, while detectives were working on getting an arrest warrant, Drummond committed suicide in September. Though there would not be justice, the friends and family of Joette now have answers. They also input Drummond's DNA into CODIS and are looking to determine if there are any other cold cases that are linked back to him. Joette's sister said in a statement to the media, A long time ago, I just came to the fact that they would probably never identify her killer. This announcement was a little bit of a letdown, but I don't feel like we didn't get justice. The DNA was a match, and it's closure. Number 3. The Package Killer Identified In 1991, several murdered women were determined by FBI profiles to be the work of one person, a serial killer named The Package Killer. On March 26, 1990, a body was found between two mattresses along the highway near Silix, Missouri in Lincoln County. Her hands were bound and her face was covered. An autopsy showed she'd been strangled to death. She was identified as Robin Myhen, a 19-year-old who lived in St. Louis, Missouri. She'd been living as a sex worker. On June 11, 1990, a body was found in a rubber trash can near Highway 55. The body was so decomposed that authorities could not determine the cause of death. She was later identified as Donna Reitmeyer, a 40-year-old woman who was last seen in the Stroll area of Cherokee Street in St. Louis. She was also a sex worker. On October 4, 1990, a woman's body was found by a jogger near Interstate 270 in a plastic trash can. She had been smothered or strangled. The woman remained unidentified for months, but was later identified as 27-year-old Brenda Pruitt, who lived on Cherokee Street, St. Louis. She was reported missing on May 9, 1990 by her family. On February 17, 1991, a body was found in a wooden box by the side of the Interstate 70 in O'Fallon, Missouri, and she was identified as Sandy Little, who was 21 years old and had been reported missing from her home on the 2800 block of Cherokee Street in September 1990. She was also a sex worker. All of these women were mothers with young children at home, disappearing only to be found months later disposed of like garbage. On October 12, 1990, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch newspaper reported that police had questioned a suspect, but the evidence was thin. I couldn't find any other reports and no person was ever charged for these crimes in 1990. These cases went cold for decades. In 2008, Sergeant Jody Weber of the O'Fallon Police Department took another hard look at these cases. These women were found in multiple jurisdictions, so Weber had to reach out and call each of them individually for their case files. For the next 14 years, she would organize evidence, witness statements, and police reports. Detective Weber would start sending physical evidence to crime labs. She constantly followed up to see if the crime labs had any new information. On April 2022, all the hard work would pay off. With new technology advancements, the St. Charles County Crime Lab was able to get a DNA match from a tiny bit of viable evidence. The match was to a convicted murderer Gary Randall Muhlberg, who is currently serving a life sentence in Potosi Correctional Center for killing Kenneth Atchison in 1993, 
over a disagreement about money. He had hidden Kenneth's body in a homemade coffin in his basement and was arrested and charged with his murder in 95. Detective Weber then went to the Potosi Correctional Center for two separate times and had showed Muhlberg the DNA evidence. In these interviews, he confessed to killing Myhan, Pruitt, and Little and gave detailed accounts of the murders in the confession. After the second interview, he sent Detective Weber a letter telling her of two other murders he had committed. When she interviewed him a third time, he gave detailed accounts of the murders he had written in the letters. With that information, she could identify Reitmeier as one of those victims. Unfortunately, with the information given, no other cases could be tied to the unknown Jane Doe Muhlberg had confessed to killing. In September of 2022, after a plea deal had been made to take the death penalty off the table, Gary Muhlberg was charged with the murders of Myhan, Pruitt, Little, and Reitmeier. Law enforcement also revealed that there are more victims whose bodies had never been found or identified. They stated that Muhlberg is believed to be fully cooperating with law enforcement. In an article for St. Louis Public Radio, Jody Weber is quoted as saying, I know it was a long time coming for me, for 14 years. I couldn't imagine what it was like for a family member waiting 32 years for answers. With Muhlberg being incarcerated all this time, it also raised questions on if something was missed in the 1993 case he was sentenced for, and why it took so long to get a DNA hit. After 30 years and so many hours on this case, the package killer from 1991 has been identified. Law enforcement does want to make it clear that this case is not done, it remains an ongoing investigation that they are willing to work on. I've been waiting since March 26, 1990, so 32 years. Decades later, there is release. My mom can rest in peace now. Yeah. This is one of the days that shows why we do this job. Prosecutors in Lincoln, St. Charles, and St. Louis counties credit cooperation for the murder charges connected to the 1990s strangulations of Robin Myhan, Brenda Pruitt, Donna Reitmeyer, and Sandy Little. Hello everyone and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today we're discussing the Torso Killer, a prolific serial killer who has recently confessed to several additional murders, closing a slew of cold cases from the New Jersey area in the 1960s to 1980s. Let's get into it. On May 22, 1980, police were called to the Quality Inn Motel in Housebrook Heights after a housekeeper reported hearing screams coming from room 117. When police arrived, they apprehended and arrested a man fleeing the motel. He was carrying a fake gun, a switchblade in his pocket, and a bag that had several pairs of handcuffs, prescription pills, a ball gag, and other bondage items. When they got to the room, they found a young woman handcuffed around the ankles, bitten, bruised, and bleeding. The man was Richard Cottingham, 33 years old at the time of his arrest. He was charged with kidnapping, attempted murder, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, aggravated sexual assault while armed, possession of a weapon, and possession of controlled substances. He had a $350,000 bail set, and he never made bail. The young woman was revealed to be Leslie Ann O'Dell. She was an 18-year-old runaway who had been working as a sex worker in Manhattan a few days before Cottingham had picked her up and taken her to New Jersey. She was tortured and sexually assaulted, and she started screaming when she thought her life was about to end. She would later testify that he, quote, said, You have to take it. The other girls did. You have to, too. You're a whore, and you have to be punished. After his arrest, police went to the home he rented in Lodi, New Jersey, which he shared with his wife and three children. There they found a room he locked from his family. In this room was jewelry and clothing from several women. Other items were also found in his car. Authorities started to take a look at Cottingham for other crimes. Richard Cottingham was born November 25, 1946 in the Bronx, New York. His family later moved to New Jersey. He graduated high school from Pasquette Valley High School in Hillsdale, New Jersey. 
After graduation, he worked at Metropolitan Life. He started in the mailroom, but after taking some computer courses, he became a computer operator. In 1966, he left that job to become a computer operator for Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. He was still working there when he was arrested in 1980. He lived with his parents until they moved away and he got married. He was known to be seen helping his mother around the house. On May 3, 1970, he married his wife Janet and they had three children together. In 1978, his wife filed for divorce. In the divorce records, his wife alleged that he had started leaving the family without the necessary funds for essentials. That he would come home in the early hours of the morning, he was known to frequent a swingers club in New York called Pluto's Retreat. She removed the petition for divorce when he was arrested in 1980, but they did get divorced after his 1981 conviction. During the investigation, they were able to tie Cottingham to a murder that had occurred in the same motel on May 5, 1980, 17 days before he was arrested. The victim, Valer Street, was a 19-year-old sex worker who was found under the bed by housekeeping in one of the motel rooms she'd been naked, handcuffed behind her back. Valer had been strangled to death. They found a fingerprint on the handcuff that was matched to Cottingham. This would start authorities down the path of discovering a serial killer. In the next few months, other authorities, as well as New Jersey police, would tie Cottingham to some horrific crimes. In the months following his arrest, he would be tied to another murder that occurred at the Quality Inn Motel in Hasbrock Heights. On December 15, 1977, 26-year-old Mary Ann Carr, an x-ray technician who had just celebrated her first wedding anniversary a few months earlier, was found by a fence in the parking lot outside the motel. She was found with a ligature still around her neck, with evidence she had been restrained with what might have been handcuffs and had tape residue over her mouth. She had small cuts and bite marks all over her body. She had last been seen at her apartment in Little Ferry, New Jersey, an apartment complex that Cottingham had lived in a few years earlier with his wife. Her apartment key was found in the lockbox of trophies found in Cottingham's home. In New York, he would be charged with the murders of three sex workers at two different crime scenes. On December 2nd, 1979, firefighters were called to a travel-in hotel near Times Square, with reports of a room being on fire. When they arrived, they discovered two bodies in the rubble. When the blaze had been extinguished, they discovered two bodies that had been set on fire. Their hands and heads had been removed and were never recovered. After the fire had been put out, authorities found some of the women's clothes folded neatly in the bathtub. They had used these clothes and put them on mannequins from a nearby department store, so they could hopefully use them to identify the women from the fire. They would eventually identify one of the victims as 22-year-old Didi Gudazi. The other victim, believed to be around the age of 16, has never been identified. This killer was given the moniker, the Torso Killer. On May 15, 1980, the body of 25-year-old Jean Rayner was found in New York's Seville Hotel. Her breasts were removed and put on the headboard, and the mattress was set on fire. Jean was working as a sex worker at the time to pay for a lengthy child custody battle with her ex-husband. For a time before DNA evidence, Cottingham seemed to be very thorough in cleaning crime scenes, leaving little to no evidence of himself. On June 12, 1981, Cottingham was convicted in New Jersey for the murder of Valer Street. In that same court case, he was charged with the kidnapping and sexual assault of four other women. All had survived various attacks. They even testified at the trial. This included the attack on Leslie Ann O'Dell. He'd been convicted of three and acquitted of one. On October 12, 1982, he was convicted in the murder of Marianne Carr. In 1984, New York authorities extradited him for trial where he was convicted on July 9, 1984 for the murders of Didi Gordazzi and the unknown victim and Jean Rayner. He would serve his nearly 200-year sentence in New Jersey State Prison. Over the next three decades, detectives would visit Cottingham often, asking him about unsolved cold cases and always leaving out critical details of the crimes from Cottingham. In 2010, their persistence would finally pay off. One of the detectives was Detective Robert Anzalotti, who interviewed Cottingham over and over for 15 years. He would eventually get confessions that would lead to the closing of several cases, 
Cottingham never seemed to know the names of his victims, but remembered details of the crimes. In August 2010, Cottingham confessed and was convicted of the murder of Nancy Vogel. In his confession, he gave details only the murderer would know. Nancy Vogel was 29 years old and was killed on October 28, 1967. She was found in her car, naked with her hands tied in front of her, with her clothes neatly folded underneath her. She'd been beaten, strangled, and sexually assaulted. Her husband had reported her missing after she did not come home. She had told her husband that she was going to go play bingo at the church in Little Ferry, New Jersey. Nancy is Cottingham's first known victim. He would have only been 20 when she was killed, and he was still living with his parents at the time. In 2014, Cottingham confessed to Anzalotti two more murders he committed, again giving details only the killer would know. First was 18-year-old Irene Blaze, who was found strangled in April 1969 in the Saddle River in Hackensack, New Jersey. She had vanished from her home. The second was 15-year-old Denise Velasca, who was abducted while walking to a friend's house in Emerson, New Jersey. She was found strangled on the side of the road near a cemetery in Saddlebrook, New Jersey. In 2017, he confessed to killing 13-year-old Jacqueline Harp in July 1968 while she was walking home at night after a band practice in Midland Park, New Jersey. She had been strangled with her bag. Though these were official confessions, they were never taken to trial and Cottingham was not convicted of these murders. The families had agreed that he was already living his life in prison and it was unnecessary now that they had answers. The facts of this, however, did not come to light until 2020, and the cases were officially closed. In 2017, Cottingham would get another visitor, Jennifer Weiss, the daughter of Dee Dee Gordazzi, who had been given up for adoption and had gone looking for her mother only to find out in 2002 that her mother had been killed in such a horrific way. She had started writing to Cottingham and she had decided she would try to be his friend and wanted information about her mother and where he had put her head. She figured the best way to earn his trust was to become his friend and in 2017, she met him face to face after writing to him. Weiss said that she asked how he knew her mother in that first meeting. Jennifer has continued to visit him and they have become friends. Weiss has talked at length about how Cottingham should confess before it's too late. On March 2021, Detective Anzalotti informed Cottingham that he was retiring and wanted him to give information on one last case before he did. It went back and forth, but on April 14, 2021, in a recorded interview, Cottingham went into detail about the murders of two young women. He even remembered their names. When asked why he remembered their names, he said, Because I was with them for a couple of days. According to the transcript, he also said, He got to know them. Lorraine Kelly was 16 and Mary Ann Pryor was 17. Cottingham had abducted them in Montville while they were on their way to the mall. He drove them to a motel and held them for two days, sexually assaulting them before he drowned them in a bathtub. He gave detailed accounts of what he did to the girls and the exact location where their bodies would be left in the woods. On October 27, 2021, he confessed to a judge and was convicted for the murders. In August of 2022, New York officials accepted and corroborated a confession that he had beaten and killed 26-year-old Lorraine McGraw on March 1, 1970. In June 2022, DNA evidence entered by the Nassau County Police on a 54-year-old cold case got a hit for Cottingham. His DNA had been entered into federal databases during his 2010 conviction. The cold case was that of Diane Cusack, a 23-year-old who was killed on February 15, 1968. She was a dance teacher who had just finished class and was going to Long Island Mall to buy new dance shoes. She was found in her car strangled. This is the only case so far that has been tied to Cottingham through DNA. After the Nassau County Police interviewed Cottingham about other cold cases in the area, after a thorough comparison of facts and evidence to his confessions, they were able to connect him to four other cold cases. Mary Beth Hines, 21, was found in a creek in Long Island on May 20th, 1972. She'd been strangled. Laverne Moy, 23, was a mother of two. She was found in the same creek strangled on July 20th, 1972. 
Sheila Hyman, 33, a mother of three, was found by her husband in their Long Island home on July 20th, 1973. Her cause of death was blunt force trauma. Her children were at summer camp at the time. For years, her husband had been the prime suspect. Lastly was 18-year-old Maria Neves. She was killed on December 27, 1973. She was found with her hands tied behind her back and wrapped in plastic. On December 5, 2022, from his prison hospital bed, Richard Cottingham was convicted of the murder of Diane Cusack, and he had made a non-prosecution agreement for the other four murders. He was sentenced to 25 years running concurrently with the 179 years he is currently serving for his past crimes. Richard Cottingham, now 76 years old, had been known as the Torso Killer and has been behind bars since his 1980 arrest. He's been convicted or officially confessed to 17 murders of women, and he might still have more victims. He has, in past interviews, stated that he's killed between 85 to 100 women. He will die in prison for his horrific crimes that spanned 13 years. Good afternoon and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. Today we're discussing the Canadian serial killer that plagued downtown Toronto for years, Bruce MacArthur. Let's get into it. It was on October 31st, 2001 when 35-year-old Mark Henderson clicked the lock into his bike when he saw a familiar face, Bruce MacArthur. Mark was a member of the LGBTQ community and recalled seeing Bruce in Toronto's gay village numerous times, and the two often exchanged acknowledging nods and small remarks when they passed each other. This evening, however, was different. As Mark locked up his bike, he saw that Bruce was jogging over to him, eager to start a conversation. The time was around 12.34 p.m. Mark happily chatted with Bruce and even invited him into his apartment to look at his Halloween costume. Just minutes later, things would take a turn for the worst, and the rampage of Canada's most prolific serial killer would begin. In Mark's own words to the Daily Mail, Mark said, quote, I was unlocking the door when I felt a whack. It happened so fast, I kind of fell into my apartment and thought maybe part of the ceiling had fallen. I turned and I remembered seeing Bruce looking like a wild man. I can't emphasize how horrified I was. I felt betrayed. I realized he was trying to kill me. The sudden attack dazed Mark, and he desperately tried to get to his feet. So many questions were running through his head. Why was Bruce attacking him, and what had he done to provoke such a reaction? Mark fought for his life, weaving and trying to dodge Bruce's swinging punches. At one point, Bruce grabbed a metal bar and broke two of Mark's fingers, leaving him screaming in agony. Mark was able to run to the phone and dial 911 at 12.39 p.m. Operators immediately dispatched the police to his Toronto apartment, and Mark hid from Bruce, who was trying to pull out the phone from the wall. When emergency services arrived at Mark's apartment, Bruce had already fled. Mark described that he was laughed at by paramedics who asked whether he had invited him into his apartment for an intimate time together. Shortly after the attack, Bruce handed himself into the Toronto police, bringing some relief to Mark, but his ordeal was far from over. Instead of taking the attack seriously, Mark alleges that the media brandished him as a street worker and that he deserved what had happened to him. Bruce had also tried to spin the narrative, telling police that it was a private matter between the two. The fierce media campaign to portray Mark in a negative light worked. Bruce was sentenced to one year of house arrest, followed by three years of probation. He was also banned from Toronto's gay village. 
As law enforcement would find out, this ban was wholly unenforceable, and the sentence of house arrest and the undertaking of a psychological assessment did little to dissuade Bruce MacArthur's murderous plans. This first attack in 2001 should have sent alarm bells ringing for the police. Instead, it would later become a case study for the major failings of the Toronto police and their inability to keep LGBTQ people safe in Toronto and Canada. To Bruce, this light punishment signaled that he could do whatever he wanted, to whomever he wanted, as it was clear that marginalized communities were not cared about. Bruce MacArthur, born October 8, 1951, to parents Isley and Malcolm, was said to have had lived a happy and humble life on his family's farm in Woodville, Ontario. Bruce and his sister had miles of land to explore and play, and it was clear from a young age that Bruce was not a rule breaker. His parents were strict and also religious. One of his former classmates recalled that kids called Bruce the teacher's suck, and never once saw him get into trouble. Starting in grade 9, Bruce attended Fenelon Falls Secondary School and was enrolled in a four-year program. He got good grades and kept his head down, and those around him believed that he would have a happy and successful career ahead of him. At Fenelon Falls, he met Janice Campbell, the woman everyone thought was the love of his life. The two got married, moved to the big city of Toronto, and by 1986, they'd given birth to two children, but not all was well. Bruce had a battle ranging inside him. Whilst he cared for Janice, he did not have romantic feelings for her. He was gay, but within his community and his church, he wouldn't be able to come out for years. His family life continued as usual until the 1990s, when Bruce dropped the bombshell. When his parents had passed, he was finally ready to come out to his wife that he was gay. Bruce's job as a salesman for McGregor, Hosiery, and Stanfields took him all over Ontario. During his travels, Bruce began to have affairs and sexual encounters with men, confirming what he already knew deep down. Bruce and Janice continued to live together until the late 90s. The two found themselves bogged down with financial issues after Bruce was let go from his job. Following the separation with his wife, Bruce moved into an apartment in Toronto on Don Mills Road, officially starting his new life. As we know, in 2001, he attacked Mark Henderson, but had received little punishment. In Bruce's mind, this was a go-ahead symbol. Bruce wasn't the only one in the family who displayed deep-seated issues. Throughout the 90s and into the 2000s, Bruce's son, Todd McArthur, was sentenced to 14 months in prison after he made obsessive and obscene phone calls to women he did not know. John Bradford, a forensic psychologist, would later tell the National Post, quote, There are some very preliminary studies that suggest there might be some kind of neurobiological disorder common to sadosexual mass murders, but it's far from conclusive, end quote. As the 2000s rolled through, Bruce went from strength to strength. Due to his white hair and beard, he landed a few seasonal jobs as a mall Santa. When not bellowing out ho ho ho, Bruce owned and operated a landscaping business. His assistants were primarily young immigrant men, and some clients noted that his pool of assistants often changed. After a long day of work, Bruce would stalk the gay village, an area he'd been banned from by the police. Unfortunately, there was no way for this rule to be enforced, and Bruce was free to roam around as he pleased. In 2010, members of the gay community in Toronto realized that one of their own had disappeared mysteriously. 40-year-old Skandaraj Nevaratnam, originally from Sri Lanka, had failed to contact his family or friends. Skanda, as he was lovingly known, was last known to have been seen at Zipper's Bar, a popular gay bar, on September 6, 2010, but he wasn't alone. Witnesses recalled seeing him in the company of an older white man, which was the last time he was seen. At first, law enforcement were slow to act, insisting that Skanda had left on his own accord. But his friends knew that wasn't the case. Skanda had recently gotten a puppy. He had saved up for months and months looking for a French bulldog and was extremely devoted to his new pup. Those close to him also knew that if he'd planned to go away for a bit, he would have arranged care for the puppy. When his apartment was searched, the dog had been alone for a while. 
It would take Toronto PD months to take the case seriously, and then on December 29, 2010, 42-year-old Abdul Basir Faizi also disappeared after last being seen in Church and Wellesley Street. Abdul left behind a wife and children who knew he would never walk away from them. The Toronto police found themselves under mounting pressure from the LGBTQ plus and Muslim communities to do something. Months after his disappearance, Abdul's car was found abandoned kilometers away on St. Clair Avenue and Mount Pheasant Road. Two years later, on October 14, 2012, 58-year-old Majid Kahan, an immigrant from Afghanistan, disappeared. Like Skanda and Abdul, Majid's gay life was a well-hidden secret from his family and friends. The police now had three missing men, all connected to the gay village, and it was time for something to be done. The Toronto police put together Project Houston, which saw hundreds of hours put into investigating these three disappearances. According to reports, Bruce MacArthur was questioned, as he was known to frequent many of the same places the men had last been known to frequent, and officers also learned that Skanda and Majid had worked for him. The Toronto PD failed to uncover any evidence to implicate Bruce, and months later the task force was disbanded in 2014, much to the community's dismay. Just a year after the task force had been disbanded, another man would disappear. 50-year-old Sarush Mahmoudi. Sarush and his wife had fled from Iran to Canada as refugees and landed in Toronto. Unfortunately, Sarush would face many horrors shortly after his arrival. The Toronto police had a lot of cases on their plate. With the disbandment of Project Houston, they assumed that there would be no more disappearances linked to the gay community, and they were wrong. Just because no missing person reports were made doesn't mean that no one with connections to the community went missing. The Toronto police would uncover these unreported victims much later down the line. On April 30th, 2017, 44-year-old Salim Eason was reported missing. Like many other victims, Salim was last seen in the downtown Toronto area and had dropped off the map. Whilst the Toronto PD did investigate these disappearances, Many would later say that their judgments and investigations were clouded by systematic and institutionalized racism. On June 26, 2017, Pride celebrations would take place in Toronto, and people from the LGBTQ community and their allies would gather in the streets to celebrate how far the community had come and what they had achieved. Amongst them was 49-year-old Andrew Kinsman, a well-established member of the Toronto gay community, Three days after he had attended Pride celebrations, Andrew was reported missing. Upon receiving this report, the Toronto PD stormed into action. Andrew was a white man, and the disappearance of a white gay man was a catalyst for the investigation that followed. Many would later criticize the Toronto Police Department's decision and the fact that it was Andrew Kinsman's disappearance that triggered a full investigation. This time, the Toronto PD set up Project PRISM, which aimed to uncover the mystery behind Andrew's disappearance and the disappearance of other gay men in the area. Investigators also discovered that the disappearances from Project Houston carried many similarities to those from Project PRISM. For the first time, the disappearance of all of these men who had been sidelined were taken seriously, and it didn't take long for investigators to get their first breakthrough. In many missing persons cases, the first move is to examine the victim's personal life, and after searching Andrew's apartment, they uncovered a vital clue. The name Bruce was handwritten on Andrew's calendar on June 26. The Toronto PD were familiar with Bruce, and that being Bruce MacArthur. He'd already been known to assault one man in 2001. According to one report, investigators also discovered messages on BDSM and dating sites between Andrew and Bruce. Bruce had been using a screen name, but just weeks into their investigation, they discovered the smoking gun. CCTV footage captured outside of Andrew's apartment showed him getting into a red 2004 Dodge Caravan on June 26, 2017, after he'd been to the Pride celebrations. Investigators began digging through records of all red Dodge caravans and eventually found five men named Bruce who owned one. 
Using the specific parameter of 2004, the Toronto PD discovered that there was just one Bruce who owned a 2004 model, and that was Bruce MacArthur. The Toronto police quickly searched the name Bruce MacArthur and found that in 2016, a surviving victim had reported him for choking them. After a record of violence and evidence and he was the last person to see Andrew alive, the Toronto PD were granted permission to seize his van as evidence, but there was one problem, it wasn't at his home. Luckily, investigators found it weeks later in a wrecking yard in Cortese, Ontario. It appeared that Bruce had attempted to destroy the evidence by selling the vehicle. A forensic examination was conducted and bloodstains and other DNA samples matched back to Andrew Kinsman and Salim Essen, proving that they'd been in Bruce's van. According to Global News, after making this shocking discovery, the Toronto PD were permitted by the courts to obtain Bruce's computer and clone it. What they would find would shock them. Bruce MacArthur had a dark and sadistic mind, and his PC reflected that. After cloning his machine, investigators found folders dedicated to each victim and each disappearance. These pictures depicted the men both alive and deceased. Many photos taken post-mortem had been posed or dressed up for Bruce's amusement. The Toronto police were building their case and waiting for the right time to strike, which came on January 18, 2018. Bruce was known to frequent online dating websites and forums for gay men. There were whisperings in the community that Bruce was known to be especially sadistic in the bedroom. Many victims would later say that Bruce had choked them into unconsciousness, and they were terrified for their lives. On January 18, 2018, another unsuspecting man arrived at Bruce's home, believing that the two were about to engage in consensual actions. Without warning, the Toronto PD burst through the doors of Bruce's home and discovered the man who had entered just moments earlier. They found the victim unconscious, handcuffed, with a black bag placed over his head. The police had struck just in time, and then 67-year-old Bruce MacArthur was arrested. Not only was he arrested for assault, but also murder. At this point in time, detectives did not know how many victims they would uncover. Okay, sir, and your name is? Bruce MacArthur. And if you could spell it for me, please. Uh, B-R-U-C-E and MacArthur M. Small c, capital A R T H U R. Okay, sir. And uh, <coughs> right now, uh, you're under arrest. Uh, you were placed under arrest this evening for the offense of assault. Okay. Uh, you've been brought here to 32 Division for the purposes of being investigated uh, for that offense. Okay. Right. So a few minutes ago, we just had a brief conversation. I introduced myself, and I gave you an opportunity to provide a statement. And you said that you wanted to do so. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And at the same time, I also asked you if you wanted to speak to a lawyer before doing so. I'm going to ask you again, do you wish to do that before we begin? No, it's fine. Okay, sir. Um, so, uh, an allegation has been made against you, and this officer in just a moment is going to let you know exactly what that allegation is, okay? What I'm going to do to you uh, right now is just read you a caution and let you know um, that you're being investigated for the offense of assault, okay? You're not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so, but whatever you say may be given in evidence. Do you understand? I do. Okay. Do you wish to say anything in answer to the charge? Again, they just do you wish to provide us a statement with yes. some clarity as to yes. what happened? Okay. So just to understand, sir, again, you're not under any obligation to give us the statement whatsoever. You're allowed to uh, cease uh, communicating with us at any time, but uh, we're certainly giving you an opportunity to, to present your side of the story. So this officer is just going to give you an overview here of what's being alleged, okay? So the allegations are that around uh, 6.30 p.m. this evening, uh, you met up with a gentleman by the name of... Um, at the intersection of Bathurst and Finch. Um, during the course of, uh, of your involvement with him, there was an allegation made of an assault, which uh, in uh, choking uh, was the allegation made. And, uh, and that's basically why you're under arrest today for that assault. Okay. Okay. So sir, if you would like to uh, provide us with your account of what occurred uh, earlier this evening. Well, I meant we talked about going for dinner, and I, he said he needed to take a shower, so I said I'd meet him at the Tim Hortons at Finch and Bathurst. And um, so he arrived, and um, we were going to have sex, and he suggested do it in the back of his truck, since it hadn't been used yet. It was a brand new truck. I said, well, there's more room in the back of my van. So we went to my van. Um, 
and we started um, kissing, and he, I put my hand down his pants, and he wanted me to squeeze his penis, but then he said he wanted harder to pinch it, to pinch and pinch and pinch as, as hard as I could. So I did. <laughs> um, and he got aroused by that. And um, so then I thought, okay, he likes it rough. So I put my hand to his throat. And just for a f few seconds, because he bef before that he, he's very strong, he just completely turned around and grabbed me by the throat. He said, N and he said, now I'm going to show you what I'm going to do to you. And he had me by the throat to the point that I couldn't breathe. So I put my hands like up in the air like a surrender because I couldn't talk. And that's when he finally let go. And then he jumped out of the car. He said, um, I don't want to see you again. So I sat there because I was kind of out of breath. And I thought he was getting in his car to leave because he started the car and it was running. I could hear it running because he was parked right beside me. And um, the next thing I heard him say, N uh, it's 911 or whatever. And so I thought, oh gosh, he's calling the cops. And so um, I got out and then he got out and, and walked around and was taking my license plates and um, that. And so um, that's when I got kind of up tight and I got in the car and I drove off. And then the more I thought about it, I thought, well, I should go and give my side of it, but I could not think of like where a police station was in that area. So I, the only one I could think of was downtown, but then I thought, realized there's one somewhere in Eglinton, and that's where I drove to. Anything like this ever happened before where things got out of hand? Not like that, no, not that quickly, or not, not, you know, just like that. Okay. Things have never gotten violent? No. No, okay. Um, so you indicated that, I think it was around 6.30 p.m., you said? Yeah, between 6.30 and 7. Okay. And you said you I met think the... Yeah, something like that, I think, would be 6.30 and 7. Yeah. Okay. And you said you met at the Tim Hortons parking lot at Bathurst and Finch, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so it still would have been bright outside at 6.30, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And you indicated that you were going to have sex in his truck, but it was new. He suggested that, and I said, well, there's more room in the back of my van than there is your truck. Okay. And what kind of truck did he have? A Ford, um, a Ford something, four-door. Okay. And your van is? A what? It's a Dodge Caravan. Dodge Caravan? And you said that the two of you were parked beside each other, right? Yeah. And then you went into your van, is that right? And then you said you started kissing. Yeah. And that's when this incident basically happened, is that right? Well, then <coughs> my hand went down his pants and he said, squeeze, you know, pinch it as hard as you can. Okay. Um, what part of the van were you in when this happened? Back seat. Back seat. Like the back seat or like the very back of? Well, there's only one seat. Actually, it, the seats are all out except for one seat. One bucket seat is in, in there. Okay. So yes. there's quite a bit of room. Okay. And was there a possibility for anybody else to see what had gone on? Yeah. Okay. Why do you say that? Well, because you're lying on the floor. Who could see you? Oh, so you were down some? Yeah. Okay. Lying flat on the floor. Okay. And you indicated that you started to uh, pinch his penis, and he indicated that he wanted it uh, rougher, I believe. He, he said harder, as hard, hard as you can do it. Yeah. Okay. And at that point, you said that you motioned your hands up to his neck. Well, after, uh, you know, we did that for a while until he was getting harder and harder. Okay. Okay, so I, I figured he obviously liked that. Okay. And what was your um, reason for bringing your hands up to his neck? What was your understanding? I just think I thought he liked it rough. The Toronto PD focused their efforts on 53 Mallory Crescent, where Bruce had worked as a landscaper for years. 
crime scene investigators and forensic anthropologists were dispatched to the scene, and over the course of several weeks, they uncovered the remains of eight men. They had been dismembered and buried. Two of these victims, 43-year-old Dean Lysowick and 37-year-old Krishna Kumar Kenagaratnam, had never been reported missing. Bruce MacArthur was arrested following these shocking discoveries. He could no longer hide his murderous tendencies. According to a statement of facts released by Toronto Superior Court, Bruce MacArthur often staged and photographed his victims in fur coats and other items, both before and after they had been murdered. He also disposed of their bodies at the property he was working on by burying their bodies in planters or in a ravine. This document also revealed that Bruce kept trophies from most of his victims. In total, he kept Skanda's bracelet, Dean's jewelry, and Salim's notebook. It also revealed how Bruce used ligature or heavy objects to take the lives of these men. Once they were deceased, he would extensively photograph them before dismembering their bodies and burying their remains at the Mallory Crescent property where he was a landscaper. There's also evidence to suggest that Bruce sexually assaulted his victims before dismemberment. Mobin Azhar, a journalist who covered Bruce's case extensively, told the Metro newspaper, quote, His rituals were certainly grim. Bruce liked mementos of his crimes. He took pictures of one decapitated body. In other instances, he put cigars in his victims' mouths, putting them in furs, making them pose. He would move the body parts around in those plant pots. He would sit amongst those pots and eat his lunch with his victims." End quote. The evidence against Bruce was undeniable, and in January 2019, Bruce MacArthur pled guilty to all eight counts of first-degree murder. As Bruce had entered a guilty plea, the families of the victims were spared a long and difficult trial where they would have to hear the cruelty that Bruce had inflicted upon their loved ones. Bruce MacArthur was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 25 years. Bruce has never told the police why he committed these crimes or why he began his serial killer career at the age of 61. He is now 71 years old and won't be eligible for parole until he is 91. Many suspect that Bruce is behind many more disappearances and murders within the community, and the Toronto PD is currently investigating any possible additional victims. The LGBTQ plus community have been very vocal about the mishandling of the Bruce MacArthur case. Mark Henderson, one of the first known victims and possibly sole survivor of MacArthur, joined the Toronto PD in a bid to be the officer both he and the community needed. He left in 2009 and returned to modeling. In the aftermath of the Bruce MacArthur case, retired Ontario Court of Appeal Justice Gloria Epstein penned an independent review of how Mark's case was handled. She has made over 151 recommendations noted that the dismissal of Mark's report was particularly troubling. Good afternoon and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. Today we are discussing a Colorado mystery that has recently been solved. January 6, 1982 had brought a brutal winter storm to Colorado. A sheriff from Denver, Colorado, Harold Bray, looked out the plane window as they flew over the Quinella Pass. He was headed to California, hopeful to leave the snowy blizzards behind but his plan became a little derailed when something caught his eye. 
flashing lights. Focusing in on the pulsing lights, it took him only a second to recognize the familiar pattern. It was an SOS distress signal. Three short, three long, then three more short pulses of light. Bray alerted the pilot, who was able to note the coordinates and radioed the Federal Aviation Administration, or the FAA, and they dispatched two smaller planes to investigate. They were able to quickly find the source of the lights. It was a pickup truck. Two vehicles, equipped to handle the whiteout conditions, were sent out in a string of miraculous events rescued a man. 30-year-old Alan Phillips had become stranded crossing the Colorado Mountain Pass. He had been traveling without snow chains and his truck became stuck. He had heard a plane flying overhead and used his headlights to flash the distress signal. He had no idea his plan could work. The plane had been flying over a thousand feet overhead, but it was 20 below and he had run out of options. He had already come to terms with the likelihood of freezing to death in his vehicle. Phillips was asked by law enforcement why he was out there in the middle of the night during a snowstorm, and he claimed that he'd been caught unexpectedly driving from Bailey, Colorado to his hometown in Georgetown. He said he'd spent the evening at a bar and wasn't thinking clearly. The rescue made national headlines, both in applauding Bray's heroic catch, as well as a cautionary tale to remind people to prepare their vehicles for appropriate weather. Phillips was dropped off at home after a long conversation about winter safety, and no one thought much more about it after that. On January 7th, only a day after the Alan Phillips rescue, a grisly discovery was made. The body of a young woman was discovered off of Highway 9, near an overpass at the summit of Hosier Pass. The woman, later identified as Barbara Bobby Jo Oberholzer, had been reported missing by her husband Jeff the previous evening. Bobby Jo had called him after work that evening and let him know that she was going to be home late. A couple of people from work had invited her for drinks, and she was going to stay out for a bit. She said she had intended to hitchhike home. This was common in Breckenridge. It was a ski resort town, and it was common for people to hitchhike to and from there to surrounding communities. Bobby Jo and her husband lived in Alma, about 30 minutes away. She and her husband had lived in the area for a few years. He was an appliance repair tech, and she worked as a receptionist. It had been widely regarded as a safe community, and this murder case had been quite a shock to the locals. Bobby Jo had been shot twice in the chest, her cause of death was blood loss from her injuries. She had been found 20 feet from the highway at the bottom of an embankment. Several belongings from her purse were also located, some as far as 20 miles along the highway headed towards Denver. A set of keys was found near Bobby's body, as well as an orange sock. The keys were determined to belong to Bobby, but what confused investigators was that the sock wasn't. Investigators made no secret of who they thought was responsible for the killing, Jeff Oberholzer. There wasn't any evidence tying him to the crime, but the police found it convenient that Jeff had no alibi as he claimed to have been home asleep. When he woke during the night, he got in his truck and headed to the pub that Bobby had been at. Her friends were surprised to see him and told him that she had left hours earlier around 7.38 o'clock. Jeff went to the police that night to report his wife missing but officers wouldn't file a missing persons report. The next morning, a resident had called Jeff and said that he'd found his wife's driver's license on his property. Jeff drove over there and picked it up. Jeff got some friends together and they started searching along the highway. It was Jeff that spotted a blue backpack in the snow. They pulled over and with the backpack, they also found Bobby's glove splattered in blood and several tissues also covered in blood. It was at this point that Jeff was sent home to wait, and the search was put together with locals and law enforcement, and Bobby's body was found. Other evidence collected were shell casings from the presumed murder weapon, one set of footprints that belonged to Bobby, and a plastic cord tied around her wrist. The same day that Bobby Joe's body had been found, law enforcement also received another report of a missing woman. 22-year-old Annette Schnee was reported missing when she failed to show up for work. She was a waitress and housekeeper in Frisco, but lived in Blue River, all near Breckenridge. 
And like Bobby Joe, Annette was also known to hitchhike to and from work most days, and again, for this community, that was very normal. No additional evidence was found in connection to Annette's disappearance, and unfortunately, due to bad weather, it had quickly been determined that if Nett's body was in a remote area like Bobby Joe's had been, it would be very difficult to recover after heavy snowfalls. Jeff was interviewed multiple times. He initially claimed to not know Annette, but later called officers to let him know that he'd met her once. He'd been watching the news and saw more photographs of her and realized he'd given her a ride months before her disappearance. Officers had asked Jeff to take a polygraph test, which he consented to and passed. He had always maintained his innocence as well as annoyance with law enforcement's insistence that he had something to do with his wife's murder. Six months after Annette's disappearance, her body was located on July 6, 1982. She was found in a rural area in Park County, 20 miles from where she was last seen. She had been shot once in the back and had also died from blood loss from a gunshot wound. Annette had been sexually assaulted, and it appeared that she may have been redressed by her killer or been forced to redress quickly as her clothing was in disarray. Noticeably missing, an orange sock. Officers put together a framework of what they believed had happened on January 6th. They estimated that Annette had been picked up first, around 5 p.m. The suspect drove her to a remote area, sexually assaulted her, and Annette had escaped the vehicle. Her killer had shot her once in the back and left her to die. The man then went back to Breckenridge, where he found a second victim, Bobby Joe, and abducted her. Bobby Joe had not been assaulted and she had been shot in the chest twice, which led investigators to believe that Bobby Joe may have been trying to reason with her attacker. Jeff said that Bobby would never have accepted a ride from a stranger. He had always believed it was someone from the area that she knew that had committed these murders. Officers had always believed both murders were committed by the same man. Jeff was cleared years later by DNA evidence. Other suspects had been a cab driver who had assaulted a hitchhiker in 1982, and while in jail, he had bragged to a cellmate about committing two murders and getting away with it. Another suspect was Henry Lee Lucas, another serial killer, Tracy Petrelli, all were cleared by DNA. Two other persons of interest was the woman that had been talking to Annette before her abduction, and a man whose photograph was found in Annette's wallet. Neither were identified or found for questioning. The case eventually went cold. It had been featured in the media several times and was the subject of Unsolved Mysteries in 1991. It had been a case that had been actively worked for decades. They had the killer's DNA both from Annette's body and on the tissues and glove from Bobby's things, and what they needed was for technology to catch up. In 2021, the case was put forward by the Colorado Bureau of Investigation for Genetic Genealogy. At the time, it was recognized as a relatively new option for solving cold cases, but it seemed like the only hope to solve this case. And nearly four decades after the murders, they had a suspect. Two women murdered in separate incidents after hitchhiking near Breckenridge. Those cases went unsolved for nearly 40 years. But thanks to DNA technology and investigators mm. who refuse to give up, police think they have that killer in custody. Just remarkable police work. Investigators believe the suspect remained in Colorado after the murders. CBS 4's Tori Mason at CBI headquarters, one of the agencies involved. Tori, investigators say blood found on a glove helped solve these crimes decades later. It's really crazy, Jim. You know, in the past 15 months, Metro Denver Crime Stoppers has solved eight crimes with the use of forensic genealogy. When these women were killed, forensic use of DNA evidence wasn't even involved. Now these advances in technology are bringing more families closer to justice. I have lived with a monster in my mind since I was 11 years old. It's a monster the daughter of Bobby Joe Oberholzer never thought would leave. Now, the man suspected of killing her mother and Annette Schnee is in custody, 39 years later. On February 24th, Alan Lee Phillips was arrested without incident. The 70-year-old mechanic was picked up in Dumont, Colorado, and arrested for two counts of kidnapping, murder, and assault. Phillips had lived in the area his entire life and had likely been known to both women. He is also being investigated on other crimes in the area as officers feel that due to the level of violence involved in the killings, 
these two women would be unlikely to be his only victims. On February 24th, we arrested Alan Lee Phillips, date of birth February 6th, 1951, for two counts each of first degree kidnapping, first degree assault, and first degree homicide. He was arrested in Clear Creek County. He was taken to the Park County Jail where he is now being held. It must be noted that the suspect is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. This case began with in collaboration with the United Data Connect and the Flor Colorado Bureau of Investigation. Forensic gen genetic genealogy was conducted in these two cases beginning in 2020. This included research from genealogy sites as well as other public and law enforcement records. I've known about the case since I started working with the Summit County Sheriff's Office in 1989. Um, and I've kind of been involved with it peripherally on and off throughout the years. And then when I um, went to work for the District Attorney's Office in Fair Play in 2013, then I got a lot more heavily involved in it. And then since I've been at the Sheriff's Office, really heavily <laughs> involved in it. And it's, it's a relief to have this done and to have an arrest and give closure to families. Yeah, because he, these cases get into you and you can't let it go. When it was made public that Phillips was the killer, a man involved in the rescue operation that had saved Phillips in 1982 made the connection that finally gave context as to why Phillips had been out on the Guanella Pass all those years ago. He had become stuck while fleeing the scene of the murder. No one had even put two and two together. In 1982, Phillips had been 31 years old. He had never been a suspect. He went on to marry, have children, and live his life and I think Annette's sister's statement to the media says it's best. You have 39 years of freedom, and hopefully now, it will all be taken away from you. 39 years of freedom too long. Cindy French describes her sister as outgoing and goofy. French and Smith say after nearly 40 years, the news of an arrest in the case came as a shock. I think my jaw literally hit the floor. It when, when they say it's jaw-dropping, I think that's exactly how I would describe it. I, I couldn't believe it. And, you know, days went on, and it was a shock, and I'm still having a hard time believing that it's happening and that there was an arrest. For Shani's mother, it's the start of a path to closure. She's like, oh, Scott, can you believe it? Can you believe it? She says, I'm just in a state of shock. She said, I really... Uh, I really thought my time was gonna was gonna run out, you know, before I before I found out, and so she got to find out. I pray that the rest of Alan Phillips for the murder of my wife Bobby Joe and Annette Schnee will finally, after all these decades, bring closure and peace to this hideous hideous nightmare for myself, along with all the lives he has horribly affected by his actions. I cannot thank enough all who never gave up the search for the truth. They are without doubt extremely dedicated and extraordinary individuals. Phillips is finally in the hands of the judicial system. May justice be served. This is from Jeff, better known as Obi Overholzer, the wife of Bobby Joe. The husband. the husband, I'm sorry, his wife is Bobby Joe. Phillips is being held in jail without bond while he waits trial. There have been several delays so far, but it is expected to go forward sometime this year. Stephen Ray Hessler is 58 years old. He left a Shelby County courtroom Friday, headed to an Indiana prison for the rest of his life. Good afternoon and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. Today we're discussing the solved cold case of a serial predator that has recently been identified, arrested, and convicted. Let's get into it. 
from 1982 to 1985, a small town in Shelby County, Indiana, lived under a reign of terror when a vicious masked man broke into homes at night, armed with a gun or knife, and sexually assaulted women. Shelbyville was the center of all but one of the atrocious attacks. The town is about 30 miles southeast of Indianapolis and at the time had around 20,000 citizens. The series of crimes disturbed the town and fear gripped the hearts of women for many years as that mysterious assailant remained at large. Gun sales skyrocketed and even a local hospital offered shooting lessons to the residents. Police urged women to take extra precautions, and they were told to avoid being alone, make sure to close their curtains, lock their doors and windows at night, and alter their routines as the authorities believed that the perpetrator stalked his victims before making his move. The nightmarish spree began on the night of August 14, 1982, when a woman woke up in the middle of the night after a man entered her home through an unlocked door. He held a knife to her throat, demanding money. He took some cash from her purse, then he threatened to hurt her young daughters, who were sleeping in the next room, if she didn't comply with his orders. He forced her to put on a nightgown and then proceeded to assault her. He knew that she was a recent divorcee and told her that her ex-husband paid him to intimidate her and teach her a lesson. He also threatened that he would come back to hurt and kidnap her daughters on their way home from school if she ever thought about reporting the incident to the police. A few months later, a similar incident took place on the night of November 1st, 1982. The assailant forced his way into a home where a mother lived with her son. They were both awakened at knife point, and the man threatened to hurt the little boy if the mother didn't comply with him. He made her put on lingerie and perform sexual acts while her son watched before sexually assaulting her. Similar to the previous incident, he told the woman that he was paid to hurt her and that he would come back if she contacted the police. On December 16, 1982, a mother and her 16-year-old daughter were assaulted. The daughter was awake when a man entered her room holding a knife. He forced her to perform sexual acts before taking her to her mother's room. He also compelled the mother to perform sexual acts and assaulted her. He boasted about committing other attacks and claimed that he was a police officer. He also tried to take pictures of the two women using their personal camera, but discovered that there wasn't any film. A couple of months later, on February 2nd, 1983, the suspect armed with a gun attacked a man standing outside his home and forced him inside, where his wife was waiting. He forced a couple to perform sexual acts on each other and photographed them. He told them that he was being paid to do that and stole some cash before leaving the scene. After that incident, the police feared that the suspect's behavior was escalating. They first believed that he was primarily targeting recent divorcees and women living on their own, but the last incident showed that he didn't have a problem attacking couples or breaking into homes where men were present. Over a full year after his last attack, the perpetrator struck again. On February 18, 1984, a woman was in the shower when a man forced his way into her home. The woman was completely vulnerable, and when the man took her by surprise and held her at gunpoint, he asked her if she knew anything about his other attacks and bragged that the police had arrested the wrong guy. He told her that he would leave her alone if she cooperated with him and threatened to kill her if she screamed or struggled against him. He then proceeded to assault her and took multiple photographs of her. He had told her that they had met before, and that she had served him at her job a few nights before. By saying that, he proved that he was used to stalking and keeping track of his victim's movements. He then left after stealing a small amount of cash. Then, on November 25, 1984, the assailant broke into another home. He first woke the victim's little daughter and took her to the mother's room, he held the daughter at gunpoint, and used her to threaten the mother into performing sexual acts. He then assaulted the mother while her daughter watched and left after stealing some cash. He put his crime spree on hiatus until August 17, 1985, when he forced his way into a couple's home. He forced them at gunpoint to perform sexual acts on each other and demanded they give him money. The wife told him that she had a heart condition and then faked a heart attack. 
She aimed to get some sympathy, but unfortunately, their attacker had none. He first focused his attention on the male victim. He handcuffed him, tied him to a chair, and started to beat him mercilessly. He repeatedly hit him over and over again with the back of the gun, causing permanent brain damage and a coma that lasted for months. The victim had to get speech therapy to learn how to talk again. He currently suffers from many disabilities and is confined to a wheelchair. After leaving the husband for dead, he took the woman to the garage and sexually assaulted her. He threatened to come back and kill them if they went to the police. Little did he know that he made a fatal mistake that night, which would later lead to his arrest. Around this time, the authorities noted many similarities and links between the attacks, making them confident that they were all committed by one suspect. They knew from descriptions given by the victims that he always wore military-style boots, a chained wallet, and a ski mask. His M.O. involved sexually assaulting women, sometimes with an enema bottle, and he also used Vaseline in every attack. He would often tie his victims to immobilize them, and he would take or attempt to take photographs of them. And sometimes he would even have the audacity to ask his victims for a drink and would always threaten to come back if they contacted the police. He also had a pattern of stalking and observing his victims for several weeks before breaking into their homes, and he usually attacked after 9.30 p.m. and left the crime scene before 5.30 a.m. In 1985, the Indianapolis newspaper shared a facial composite of the suspect based on the victim's descriptions. And in the same article, task force detectives said the suspect was believed to be white male, 5 foot 9 to 6 foot 1, 170 to 200 pounds with blue eyes, short to medium light brown or blonde hair, and that he was in his early to mid 30s. The victims also described him as muscular, so they believed he had an athletic body type. But despite all efforts, the suspect still managed to elude capture and the authorities were unable to discover his identity. The culprit was generally very cautious and made sure never to leave behind anything that would lead to him. He always wore gloves, wiped down surfaces, and took all the items he touched or may have left DNA on with him, such as the victim's nightgowns, towels, and bedsheets. But one time, he finally got sloppy and unknowingly left DNA behind, and that was in his final attack that took place on August 17, 1985. However, the case remained unsolved for decades, and it wasn't until 2020 that it finally had a breakthrough. A detective suggested sending the DNA sample extracted from the last crime scene to a company specializing in the same sort of DNA testing used to capture at the Golden State Killer in 2018. A company called Parabon Nano Labs, a company based in Virginia that specializes in genealogical DNA identification and uses it to solve cold cases. The test results led to two men of the same family. One of them was Stephen Ray Hessler, an ex-convict who spent most of the 90s in prison for sexual assault convictions in a county close to Shelby County. He served about 10 years in prison and was released two months before inmates were required to submit DNA samples. Investigators started watching and digging into the lives of the two men, and it didn't take long for them to eliminate the first suspect, leaving only Stephen Ray Hessler. Hessler lived in Greensburg, Indiana, and used to pay his utility mills by mail. Police used that against him as they obtained an envelope he used to send a bill payment for his water bill. They extracted DNA from the licked envelope and compared his saliva to the DNA collected back in 1985. It was a perfect match. They brought him in for questioning and they were able to obtain a better DNA sample from the inside of Hessler's cheek, further confirming the link. In the early morning hours on August 17, 2020, exactly 35 years after the last attack in Shelby County, police entered Hessler Greenberg's home with a search warrant. They described what they found inside as a treasure trove and a gold mine full of trophies and evidence from the crime scenes. They found several photographs that he had stolen from the victims, clothing and garments the victims described him wearing during the attacks, a chained wallet, ski mask, knives, handcuffs, and zip ties. They also found 30 pairs of women's underwear, an enema water bottle, petroleum jelly, Polaroid photos of the four sex acts, and newspaper clippings of the articles written about the attacks. 
Police also searched his computers and found that he'd been researching the surviving victims' names and whereabouts. He'd also downloaded a Google Earth Street View photo of one of the victims' homes in Georgia. He'd also been similarly cyberstalking the victim of his sexual assault conviction. Stephen Ray Hessler was convicted on March 3, 2022, after an eight-day trial of two counts of sexual assault, six counts of unlawful deviant conduct, and seven counts of burglary resulting in bodily injury, three counts of criminal deviant conduct, and one count of robbery, each a Class A felony. During the trial, the prosecution called 27 witnesses. Most of them were victims who bravely testified despite having received death threats. Some witnesses were flown in from as far as Florida, Georgia, and Ohio, as well as Secret Service computer technicians from the East Coast. Brad Lund Warland, the Shelby County prosecutor, said, Stephen Ray Hessler is one of the most evil, cruel, sadistic predators that I've had the pleasure of prosecuting in over 30 years. Um, he is where he needs to be. He needs to stay in jail until it's time to put him in the ground. During the trial, the prosecutor also described Hessler as a coward sadist. He clarified that Hessler is a sadist because he loves getting pleasure from hurting other people, and a coward because he could only do it when he was armed. On April 1, 2022, Stephen Ray Hessler was sentenced to 650 years in prison, 50 years for each crime. And finally, after nearly four decades, Hessler's victims are at peace, knowing their assailant would spend the rest of his life behind prison, where he belongs. It is a huge relief, I don't have to be afraid anymore, said the victim of the November 1st, 1982 attack. She also encouraged all victims of sexual assault to always come forward. Good afternoon and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. Today we'll be discussing a serial killer in Colorado that plagued the community of Aurora and Lakewood before abruptly disappearing. That killer was recently identified. But first, I want to let you know that this video is sponsored by Lomi. More on that in a minute, and with that being said, let's get into it. On January 10th, 1984, Patricia Louise Smith was sitting down for lunch. The 51-year-old interior decorator was in Lakewood, Colorado, and helping her recently divorced daughter get settled with her two young children. Originally from Nebraska, the family was settling into their new life in Colorado. Patricia was alone at home, her grandkids were at school, and her daughter was at work. Later that day, Patricia's daughter Sherry was waiting for Patricia at the park and ride. Patricia normally picked her up right after work, and it immediately concerned Sherry when she wasn't there. Sherry waited around for a little while and then called her cousin, who came to pick her up. Then the two of them collected Sherry's kids before heading home. Once there, they noticed that there weren't any lights on in the home. It was mostly dark now, and from the driveway, all Sherry could see was light from a TV flickering in her mother's bedroom. She entered the home, turned on the light, and found her mother lying on the floor. Sherry said she immediately knew her mother was deceased. Sherry grabbed her kids, who had been the first to enter the home, and they ran over to neighbors to call the police. Patricia had been covered with a blanket. She had been viciously beaten. The murder weapon had been determined to be a hammer, and she had also been sexually assaulted. It had been a brutal murder and one that shook the community. Detectives determined that the killer had entered the home via the garage and believed that the attack had happened sometime midday, as it appeared Patricia had been about to eat lunch. 
The home had also been ransacked and contents of Patricia's purse had been dumped out and a hammer was found next to Patricia. Other evidence collected from the scene was Patricia's clothing, the blanket, and the carpet underneath her body for later examination. The investigation had puzzled detectives. No one in the surrounding townhomes had heard or seen anything suspicious. They had just moved to Colorado, so they didn't believe that it was someone who knew Patricia or her family. The killer appeared to have just walked in and out in broad daylight without anyone noticing. Patricia's murder had followed a series of attacks only days before. On January 4th, a couple, Kim and Jim Habenshield, had a bizarre break-in and attack in Aurora, Colorado. It was the middle of the night two weeks ago when a man entered this house through the garage. When he left, the man and woman who live here had been beaten on the head with a hammer. They are Kim and Jim. We withheld their last names. They're convinced their attacker is the same man who killed the three members of the Bennett family. Because basically um, a hammer was used for one thing and from what detectives have said that the person that has done some of the other crimes has been described in the same manner as what I have described. Um, as far as I know, nobody's seen his face. They've just been able to describe the build and the color and, and such. Do you have any idea why he broke in here, what his motive was? I, I just thought it was money, you know, quick cash or something, because he didn't take any of the rings or jewelry or nothing like that. He did steal her purse, so we thought it was just quick money, but I think he's just, you know, either out to rape or just to hurt people. The couple awoke to have been attacked by a man wielding a hammer. When the couple started screaming, the man threw the hammer and ran out of the house. He had also entered the home through an open garage and had stolen Kim's purse. The hammer had been a standard hardware store claw hammer. Similar to Patricia's murder, no prints were found, which led detectives to believe the attacker had worn gloves. The couple had been extremely disoriented when they finally realized there was a man in their bedroom. They hadn't even initially realized they both had injuries. They were both bleeding heavily but didn't notice for several minutes. They described their attacker as a large man, but it had been too dark to see any details. The man hadn't said anything before running out of the house. Officers traced footprints in the snow from their house to a neighbor's house, and it was theorized that the perpetrator had been going door to door looking for homes that were unlocked. Then back in Aurora, Colorado, authorities linked another attack similar to the Habenshields that had occurred hours after Patricia had been murdered. Donna Dixon, a flight attendant, had been attacked in her garage by a man with a hammer. Her attacker had been hiding in her garage and had hit her on the temple as she'd been getting out of her car after work. The injury had rendered her unconscious. She had been found still alive by her boyfriend, who was a pilot and had ended his shift in the early morning hours the following day. He found Donna in their bedroom, covered in blood, with a huge injury to the side of her head. Donna had been rushed to the hospital, where she was able to recover, but detectives had to deliver the horrible news that she'd been sexually assaulted by her attacker. Well, we met obviously in the airlines. Ron Holm was a pilot, Donna Dixon a flight attendant. I said, you want to learn to play tennis? Because I was a good tennis player. Just but the relationship was slow to get off the ground. He asked me out two years before we started dating. And the second time I asked her out, if you want to play, play racquetball? Because I was a good racquetball player. I don't do she sports. Said no. Finally. Then he asked me out actually for drinks. A yes. I can handle that. <laughs> <laughs> drinks turned into dating, and that turned into living together and talking marriage. Then came January 9th, 1984. Things were just normal. Ron was on an overnight flight. Donna ran errands, returning home after dark and pulling into the garage. I know I'm safe. I'm home. I reach and grab the mail, swing the door open, and that's where my memory goes. It's now erased. Erased by a man with a hammer. He beat her unconscious, sexually assaulted her, and left her for dead one of four hammer attacks that month in the metro area. When I come to, I'm thinking, I must have really tied one on. And I'm outside of the house trying to get in and falling down, standing up, falling down. Somehow, she made it inside. 
Ron got home the next day. There's blood on the stoop, so I ran inside, ran over the, into the bedroom, and I saw her laying in bed with all this blood. In the hospital, I, I say I had the mentality of a two-year-old. Everything was new to me. Once again, I didn't know a knife and fork. I couldn't even tell you that I can't open my mouth and how hard it is to eat. They married in the midst of rehabilitation and recovery, a wig over her scarred bald head, her brain slowly healing. I would see a daddy long leg and it's a long leg daddy. It's, why would you want to get blood from a turnip? So how would you know that phrase, right? A year and nine days after nearly dying, Donna returned to work. It was a lot longer before seeing strangers no longer scared her. You always felt like, is it him? Does he recognize me? Is he gonna come after me again? Even as the attack went unsolved, they built a busy, happy life. My efforts were not to hate him, specifically, although he's an evil person. My efforts went towards helping Donna recover and being there for her. Due to how much blood was found in the concrete, Donna had been left for dead in the garage. It was estimated she'd been there for several hours, but it had been the cold Colorado winter temperatures that had saved Donna from bleeding out. When news got out that Donna lived through the attack, Donna's boyfriend was terrified someone would come back to finish the job, and he slept with a gun for months afterward. The first thing Donna remembered was waking up on the garage floor. She still had her house keys in her hand from when she'd gotten out of the car. She had no idea what had happened and started vomiting, which she attributed to drinking too much in the state of shock that she was in. She could only focus on how cold she was, both from the open garage door and the shock from the injury. She got into the house and made her way to the bedroom where she laid down until her boyfriend came home. Again, a hammer was found in the garage and Donna's purse had cash stolen from it. Then, on January 16th, the Aurora Police Department got a call for the most horrific and violent attack yet. Bruce and Deborah Bennett worked together at a furniture warehouse, and it was when neither of them showed up for work that morning that drew a cause for concern. The couple were always extremely reliable, and when their work called their house, no one picked up, which was also very unusual. One of their co-workers got in touch with Bruce's mother, Connie, and asked if she knew where they were. Connie also called the Bennetts, and when no one answered, she got in her car and drove over. When she arrived at the house, she noticed the garage door had been left open. Additionally, both of their vehicles were still parked where they normally were. As she got out of the car, she got closer to the home. She immediately knew something was wrong. Deborah's purse had been dumped out in front of the home. Then she said that the door from the garage into the home had been left ajar. She entered the home and immediately saw Bruce's body in the living room. There was blood everywhere, and she knew her son was deceased. It had been such a shock for Connie, as the family had been celebrating her granddaughter Vanessa's birthday the night before. There were still birthday plates on the kitchen counter. Law enforcement descended on the home. Bruce was found in the living room but evidence had shown that the attack had started in the couple's bedroom. Bruce had fought the attacker despite a severe head injury. Several spindles from the banister had been knocked out during the struggle. The fight had ended in the living room, where Bruce's throat was slashed. Deborah's body was found in the bedroom. She had been attacked with a hammer and sexually assaulted. The couple had two daughters. Melissa, eight years old, was found in the bedroom deceased. The youngest daughter, three-year-old Vanessa, was found wedged in between the bed and the wall with significant injuries to her entire body, and in a shock to everyone, was still breathing. Vanessa was rushed to the hospital where she was treated for a broken arm, skull fracture, shattered jaw, and several broken ribs. She was in a coma for days after the attack, and it would take her years before she recovered physically enough to leave the hospital. Both of the little girls been sexually assaulted by the attacker. She was the youngest victim of one of Colorado's most horrific crimes. Just three years old when a monster with a hammer broke into her family's home. Just three when that madman caved in her skull with a hammer and left her for dead. It's possible that she could be left with significant permanent injury. 
it's too early to tell. In those first bewildering days in January 1984, her very survival sparked hope in her grandmother. NASA is making such good progress, and I, she's going to be okay, we thank God. A mountain of evidence was collected from the home. Deborah's purse, DNA evidence left behind in both bedrooms, the knife that had been used on Bruce was found in the snow in the front yard, and a hammer was also discovered. It had been a horrific massacre, one that didn't make sense to anyone. No one had heard a thing. Law enforcement had estimated the time of attack, sometime between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m., and none of their neighbors heard anything. Bruce's brother had been at the birthday party the night before, and he remembered as he was leaving that the garage door was open. He went in and let Bruce know to close it before he left around 9 p.m. He'd left after that and didn't know if Bruce closed it before going to bed. Police say that sometime between 9 last night and early this morning, the Bennett family was brutally attacked with a blunt instrument and a knife. Probably this one found in the snow covering their front lawn. Dead are 27 year old Bruce Bennett, his 26 year old wife Deborah, and one of their two daughters, eight year old Melissa. She and her mother were found in their bedrooms. A coroner says at least one of them, Melissa, appears to have been sexually assaulted. Bruce Bennett was found lying near a stairwell. Police say all of them were wearing their sleeping clothes. One of the bystanders here this morning was a friend since eighth grade and Bruce Bennett's best man at his wedding. A friend who said no one hated the Bennetts this much. No, he doesn't have any enemies. There's no way. Bruce is this is the best kind of guy you could know. There's no way he could have any kind of enemies like this. Police say they haven't uncovered any signs of a forced entry into this home, but they aren't ruling out the possibility that someone or some people forced their way in. You wouldn't think it would happen here, one man said. Paula Woodward has more about the Bennett family. It's the type of neighborhood you think of when you're talking about life in the suburbs. Nice, quiet, friendly, young couples, young kids, safe. It's scary. Tell if me it, about that. Well, it, I don't know. If it's family related, I feel a little bit more safe, but it's, if it was done by an outsider, then it would really scare me. They were real nice, everyday people. Deborah was happy-go-lucky, Bruce the quiet type. They worked in downtown Denver, both of them at the same place. Four days ago, they were in my house. They bought this house only about uh, three, four weeks ago. They're good people, huh? I don't understand what happened. They had just moved into their new house over Thanksgiving. They had lived about six miles away, still in Aurora before then. Their oldest daughter, Melissa, died with them. She was a second grader at Fulton Elementary. I know that she was an excellent student, that uh, she cared about the other kids in her classroom, the teacher cared about her very much, and uh, I know she was planning a birthday party for uh, tomorrow uh, with her mother and with a teacher. Shock, sadness, outrage and fear. A school principal tries to figure out how to tell Melissa's classmates, a mother how to tell her daughter her friend is dead. Tracy was supposed to go to a birthday party there Friday night. But, you know, I guess she can't now. Paula Woodward, 9 News. It wasn't long before investigators tied the crimes together. With how investigations were conducted at the time, they were all given to different departments and assigned to different detectives who did their own investigations. So there wasn't a collaborative effort to find this man. We saw this happen with the investigation of the Golden State Killer. Joseph James D'Angelo, being an ex-cop, knew what it was like between different police departments and that there really wasn't any system in place to work cooperatively. This was why he attacked in different areas all the time and how he got away with so many of his attacks. In this case, there were key similarities between all of the attacks. The hammer, the high-risk blitz-style attack, getting into homes via open garages, and stealing and robbing of purses. And in each of the attacks, all the homes had been in newly constructed subdivisions. An FBI profile was done of the unknown attacker, 
The FBI felt that they were looking for a young man because the attacks didn't seem sophisticated or well thought out. All of the crimes had been messy. He'd left evidence behind, which, which led agents to believe this was an inexperienced killer. The attacks had followed a textbook escalation of violence, from attacking a couple and letting them live, to sexual assault and attempted murder, to the violent murder, and then the slaughtering of an entire family. The FBI also thought they were looking for someone who worked in construction, as newly built developments had been consistent with the victims. They also felt that all the victims were random, chosen out of convenience. Who knows how many homes he would try before finding ones with the doors unlocked. The attacker never broke into any of the homes, always entering where garages were open and the doors into the homes were unlocked. The weapons were also notable. All the hammers were different. Some were older than others, some were construction, some were more of a basic home tool, and others were specialized. But he always brought them to the crime scene. The only weapon that had been used from inside a home was the kitchen knife used to kill Bruce Bennett. The crimes had all happened in such a quick succession, and the killer had attacked every week in January and the communities surrounding Detroit braced for more attacks. But they never came. As quickly as the attacks had started, they just stopped. On January 26, 1985, in Kingsman, Arizona, Roy Williams was attacked in the middle of the night. An unknown attacker had come into his home through an unlocked back door, and Roy was awakened to a man standing over him with a rock in his hand. The man sent the rock crashing down onto his skull, but it didn't knock him out. A second blow came down, but the attacker dropped it, and instead of hitting his head for a second time, it landed on his chest, breaking a rib. Roy was able to get up and chase the man out of his house. Police came and investigated, but there had been little to go on. Roy couldn't identify his attacker because it had been too dark. What investigators did find was a very distinct set of shoe prints leading out of Roy's house. The shoe prints were so detailed, detectives could make out a number 9 indicating the shoe size. Their suspect had been wearing a size 9 tennis-style shoe. Officers in the area received a bolo, which included a photograph of the shoe tread and later that day an officer on patrol saw a man hitchhiking and pulled him over to talk to him. They talked for a couple of minutes. The man said he was unemployed and said he was from California and looking to hitchhike back. Then the officer asked to see the bottom of his shoes. The officer noticed a similarity between the treads and asked if he could come down to the police station. The officer hadn't expected this man to bolt. The man was caught 30 minutes later trying to hide. He was identified as 23-year-old Alex Christopher Ewing. He was charged with attempted murder and burglary for the attack against Roy Williams. He was held in jail while he awaited trial. Early on a Friday morning in January 1984 in Kingman, Arizona, Roy Williams woke suddenly to a 25-pound rock smashing into him. <laughs> breaking a rib, tearing open his head. And at first I thought somebody just punched me right in the chin or something. Then the shadowy figure vanished into the desert. Seven hours later, a cop stopped a hitchhiker and started asking questions. The man bolted and was later captured in a nearby canyon. It was Alex Christopher Ewing. His arrest was front page news. He faced a trial, maybe some years in prison, and that might have been the end of the story. Nine months later, on August 9th, Ewing was put on a prison transport bus for his first court date. The bus stopped for gas near Henderson, Nevada, and while correction officers weren't looking, Ewing made a run for it. Law enforcement searched all night, but weren't able to locate the missing felon. Then, the following day, they started receiving calls from residential neighborhoods with reports of a man trying to break into homes. Then later that evening, they received a chilling 911 call. Christopher Barry and his wife Nancy had turned in for the night. The couple had two children. One was an infant, and Nancy got up to prepare a bottle. When she turned the light on in the kitchen, she screamed when she saw a man standing there with a broken axe handle. 
Nancy ran back towards the bedroom where the man followed and then started to attack Christopher with the axe handle. Nancy tried to help her husband by blocking some of the attacks. Both of her wrists were broken in the process. She also had a fracture in her arm. Christopher suffered extensive injuries to his face and jaw. Nancy had been able to reach for the telephone and dial 911. The attacker just kept hitting her over and over until she eventually pretended to be dead and he suddenly left the room. Law enforcement again descended on the home in full force. Christopher and Nancy were rushed to the hospital. Their children had been unharmed. Christopher would suffer permanent damage from the attack and never fully recover. Ewing was not found that night, having eluded officers again. Two days later, on August 11th, a collect call is placed from a payphone in Lake Mead, Nevada. The operator hears a portion of the call, where the man on the other end describes escaping prison and needing help. The operator then calls law enforcement, who rush the area. Law enforcement, along with park rangers, spot Ewing still at the payphone. Ewing had called his brother. He was only wearing a pair of maroon shorts. He didn't look well. It appeared that the scorching Nevada heat had been catching up with him. He was sunburned, covered in scrapes and scratches. When Ewing saw park rangers approaching him, he tried to run, but he only got a few hundred yards away before collapsing. He was severely dehydrated and his body wasn't able to go any further. He was recaptured and he had multiple charges added to his already multiple charges. In 1985, he went to trial for the attacks against the Berries. He was convicted of two counts of attempted murder, burglary, and escape, and handed a 110-year sentence. The charges from Roy Williams' attack were dropped because he was already sentenced to multiple decades in prison and should have stayed there for the rest of his life. However, in 2020, Alex Ewing became eligible for parole due to overcrowding giving Ewing the first taste of freedom in 35 years. But what Ewing didn't know was that during a mandated collection of DNA from Nevada inmates, his DNA linked him to his crimes in Colorado, the murders of the Bennett family, Patricia Smith, and the sexual assault of Donna Dixon. I wake up thinking about it. I think about it every day. Two women bound by fate. It's a, it's a, a travesty of justice and by frustration that a suspect identified more than a year ago in two of Colorado's most notorious murder cases remains in Nevada. I'd like to see him sitting in front of a judge. A judge here in Colorado. How can this be happening? It was January 10th, 1984, that a man with a hammer raped Sherry Letton's mother and beat her to death in Lakewood. Patricia Louise Smith was 50. Six days later in Aurora, a man with a hammer killed Connie Bennett's son, Bruce, his wife, Deborah, and their daughter, Melissa. Only three-year-old Vanessa survived, barely. For nearly 35 years, there were no answers. A break in a murder case. And then, cold for more than three decades. In August 2018. We believe Mr. Ewing is responsible. A suspect identified through DNA, Alex Christopher Ewing, a Nevada inmate serving time for an attack there. We will be going to the governor's office and requesting that Mr. Ewing be extradited from the state of Nevada. This matter could take anywhere from a couple of weeks to perhaps a month or two. We just don't know. Mr. Ewing, the court has received a demand for your surrender to authorities in the state of Colorado. Do you object to being turned over to Colorado authorities? I'd like to apply to since then, his attorney has engineered multiple delays as he appealed. A request for 30 days because his assistant had been in an automobile accident several blocks from the law office. For an additional 11 days because of extraordinary circumstances and extreme need. For 60 more days because he had been unable to complete the daunting task of preparing a brief. The Nevada Supreme Court denied the last request 65 days after it was made, leaving Sherry Letton and Connie Bennett disgusted with the process and with Ewing himself. And the excuses are nothing short of my dog ate my homework. That guy in, in Nevada, uh, I think he's a waste of oxygen in this world. I'm, I'm looking forward to, the, to get, getting through this and seeing justice done. 
for my family, for my mother. We lost a mother, a wife, a grandmother. We've missed 35 years of having this beautiful woman in our life. The Colorado District Attorney scrambled to get Ewing extradited to Colorado so he could be charged in connection with the string of attacks from 1984, and after two years, he finally gets Ewing back in Colorado, eliminating any chance of parole for Ewing. Unfortunately, charges couldn't be brought forward in Donna's attack, nor his first attack on the Haben Shields due to the statute of limitations being up on both of those crimes but DNA linked him to the Bennett murders, as well as Patricia Smith, which the DA opted to try those cases separately. The charges related to the Bennett murders came first, since it had the most evidence, and during that investigation, they learned that Ewing matched the first FBI profile to a T. Ewing had been a high school dropout from Sacramento, California. He traveled to Colorado, where he lived there for about a year, and worked in construction particularly new builds. He had worked in several of the developments that he had chosen to find victims in. At the time of the attacks, he'd been 23. But Ewing hadn't been what detectives had been expecting. Ewing was 5'6", he had a small frame, and now 61, he had seemed quite frail. Hardly what they expected from a man they'd been searching for for almost four decades. He didn't seem capable of the brutal assaults afflicted on his victims. But while they interviewed him, he had displayed seething rage, and the facade of the frail old man had disappeared. If Alex Ewing were to ever be released, they were certain he would kill again. He also had a violent criminal history dating back to 1979 for several burglaries. He had previously been in jail for those crimes, and he'd only just been released in 1984 when he started the killing spree in Colorado. The trial for the Bennett murders began in August 2021, and the jury deliberated for two days before coming back with a guilty verdict on all counts and sentenced to 40 years in prison. Then, in April 2022, the trial for Patricia's murder. This time, the jury only deliberated for four hours before handing down a unanimous guilty verdict, adding another life sentence and eliminating any possibility of parole. For a 2018 DNA match led investigators to him. DNA was at the center of the opening statement, the prosecutor arguing that the presence of Ewing's semen at the scene shows that he committed the crime, and a defense attorney asserted that other physical evidence points to someone else as the killer. By the end of the case, it's all going to link up. It's all going to show that the defendant is the person who did this. It doesn't make sense because it ignores that the physical evidence points to someone else. Their theory is wrong, and their theory does not make sense. And the reason it doesn't make sense is because Alex Ewing did not kill Patricia Smith, did not rape Patricia Smith, and is not guilty. Ewing was convicted in August of killing Bruce and Deborah Bennett and their daughter Melissa in Aurora a week after Patricia Smith's murder. He's serving three life sentences for those murders. There was a sense of relief from Ewing's surviving victims. Connie Bennett said of Ewing, Some people may call him an animal, but I won't because I think animals have a purpose in this world. Vanessa Bennett also made several statements outlining the pain and suffering she had in her life due to the lasting physical and emotional pain she had been in since January 16, 1985, when her whole life changed. I don't remember anything at all, honestly. People ask me all the time if I remember things, but I don't. Today, Vanessa Bennett is okay, but not entirely okay. I have a metal plate in my forehead. Um, I had frontal, I guess frontal lobe issues because I was hitting hammer. My skull kind of breaks right here. Um, my jaw pretty much is shattered. I had a tracheotomy here. I have a shattered pelvis. But I guess, um, I healed pretty well. Her childhood was difficult. I was made fun of in school because my parents were killed. I was made fun of because 
the hammer man, or whatever you want to call it, was going to come to my house and hurt everybody when I had slumber parties and stuff. I was made fun of for a long time. Adulthood has been even harder. I had issues with my grandmother growing up because of my, you know, anger issues. And I was hurt growing up. She was hurt. And well, that is it for this video. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you like this content and what I do over here, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. As always, if you would give this video a like if you enjoyed the content, that would be much appreciated as it helps the channel to grow. We also have channel membership as well as Patreon if you want to get more behind the scenes content as well as just supporting the channel. In the description box, you will find links to all my socials to connect with me as well as other goodies. But that is it for me. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you on the next one. Bye for now. Hello everyone and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today we're discussing another cold case solved by DNA, and this time another serial killer who may have been active in the late 70s and 80s has possibly been identified. Let's get into it. 19-year-old Cheryl Thompson was described as a sweet and kind woman by her friends and family. In early 1978, Cheryl was a student at the University of Cincinnati and was in her first year of her studies. Cheryl had taken well to student life and made lots of friends. Like most students, Cheryl liked to unwind at local bars and clubs when not studying or attending classes. In March 1978, tragedy would befall the Thompson family and it would take four decades before the family finally got some answers. The end of March 1978 marked the beginning of spring break. Droves of students left their dorms and studies behind to spend the next week or two soaking up the sunshine and letting their hair down. For Cheryl Thompson, spring break meant only one thing, family time. She made the short trip from her dorm at the University of Cincinnati to her parents' house in Oakley, a suburb of Cincinnati. She spent the first part of the week with her family and also used the time to catch up with old friends. The high school buddies discussed what college was like for them and what their futures may look like. It was a Friday night on March 24, 1978. Cheryl spent most of the day at the family home before deciding to hit the bars of Oakley. There was a disco at Gatsby's Bar and Cheryl agreed to meet her boyfriend there. At 10.30 p.m., Cheryl left the house, saying goodbye to her little brother, Danny. Shortly before leaving, Cheryl received a call from her friend, Laura Bressert, who had initially agreed to attend the disco, but at the last minute, Laura backed out and even begged Cheryl to follow suit. Laura would later tell news outlets, quote, I begged her on the phone not to go because I had a bad feeling. Cheryl ignored Laura's advice and headed for the bar. By midnight, Cheryl's boyfriend had become worried. Cheryl had never arrived at the bar and had an uneasy feeling overcome him. He began to search the bar and walked the entire route from the bar to Cheryl's parents' house, but there was no sign of her. News outlets reported that Cheryl's boyfriend found her car parked on a street close to the bar. According to the news, the boyfriend collected a second pair of keys from Cheryl's brother and, quote, moved it to a legal parking space and continued his search. At around 5.30 a.m., he spotted something bizarre. Cruising down the road was a strange-looking man. When Cheryl's boyfriend looked again, he realized the man was driving Cheryl's car. He began chasing the man on foot but was unsuccessful, losing the car near Hyde Park Plaza. The bizarre events of the evening had left Cheryl's boyfriend reeling, and by early morning, he had arrived at her parents' house to tell them the bad news. Cheryl's parents knew something was amiss when she failed to return home that morning, finding that her bed had not been slept in. Her parents were faced with the difficult task of reporting their daughter missing. The Loveland Police Department arrived at the Thompson home to take statements and evidence, and the search for Cheryl began. 
Officers retraced Cheryl's steps, but found no sign of her. There was no evidence to suggest that she'd ever made it to the bar, so where was she? The University of Cincinnati confirmed that Cheryl never made it to any of her classes once spring break was over. Investigators did not believe that Cheryl had run away. Law enforcement found her vehicle parked near the bar the next day. The car, other than being abandoned, showed no signs of anything suspicious. Two weeks later, on April 8, 1978, a state natural resource officer, Mike Surio, was making his rounds on the bank of the Little Miami River close to E. Kemper Road. He was looking for the owners of two cars parked near the riverbank. It was his job to make sure anyone fishing in the area had the correct licenses. It was as he was walking that he saw something in the brush. It was a foot. Upon further examination, he realized it was the body of a woman. The Loveland Police Department was immediately summoned to the scene, and everyone's worst fears were confirmed. The police confirmed that the body belonged to the missing 19-year-old Cheryl Thompson, and she'd been found partially clothed before being dumped close to the river. The Hamilton County Chief's Deputy Coroner, Dr. Paul Jolly, performed Cheryl's autopsy. In his report, he noted that Cheryl had suffered blunt force trauma to the head and had been strangled and sexually assaulted. The brutality of Cheryl's death shocked her family as well as the residents of Oakley. Cheryl had been an average 19-year-old university student. Who would want to harm her and why? Residents tightened their security measures and women were more cautious of unknown men. Cheryl Thompson's brutal murder wasn't the only one that rocked Hamilton as well as surrounding counties. In 1978, shortly after Cheryl's body had been discovered, news reports began connecting Cheryl's case to others in the area. According to this report, at least 15 other girls and women were found murdered between 1976 and 1978, all under similar circumstances. The list reported goes as follows. Lisa Jansen, 12 years old. Charmaine Stola, 17 years old. Nancy Ann Theobald, 18 years old. Diane Sue McCroby, 16 years old. Elaine Bear, 15 years old. Nancy Gritsby, 23 years old. Victoria Hincher, 24 years old. Dorothy Sullivan, 18 years old. Linda Dyer, 15 years old. Mary Ruth Hopkins, 21 years old. Carol Sue Clabler, 16 years old. Unidentified, 25. Susan Gorman, 19 years old. Linda K. Harmon, 17 years old. Cora Ellen Durham, 27 years old. Hamilton residents feared a serial killer was on the loose and nobody knew who could be next. In 1978, DNA evidence was not yet available. However, the coroner, Dr. Jolly, and crime scene investigators obtained swabs from Cheryl's body to preserve for future use. One of these swabs was what was now commonly referred to as a sexual assault kit. Dr. Jolly could not establish an exact time of death, although he believed she'd been there for around three days. Cheryl had been missing for much longer than three days, so what had happened to her during that time? Cheryl's boyfriend was thoroughly interrogated and questioned, and he was eventually dropped as a possible suspect. Investigators combed through mountains of paperwork, looking for a golden clue, but Cheryl's case quickly turned cold. For decades, the swab kit sat in paper bags in the evidence locker of the Loveland Police Department office. Cheryl's murder left a hole in her family's lives. She never finished her degree, started a family, or bought a home. The anniversary of her murder was a painful reminder to her family. In 2012, a glimmer of hope came when the Loveland PD decided to reopen the case. The DNA samples that had been sitting on shelves were once again analyzed. This analysis led to the discovery of a partial DNA profile. The profile was submitted to CODIS, but unfortunately, there were no matches. Loveland investigators felt that they were back to square one. They now had a DNA profile, but needed help figuring out who it belonged to. In 2012, the Loveland PD decided to submit the swab to a third-party ancestry database after seeing the success that had brought to cases such as the Golden State Killer. The exact company used was not specified. When these DNA samples were sent off for analysis, the company took just a few weeks to narrow it down to a single family tree. A brother, cousin, and an uncle from this family agreed to submit to a DNA test, which eventually ruled them out as suspects. 
genealogists were able to tick off male members of the family until they reached one name, Ralph Howell. Howell had been employed as a delivery truck driver for the Cincinnati Inquirer and was an over-the-road truck driver. Ralph had died in 1985 in a car crash, but his criminal history cemented him as a primary suspect. Two years before his death, in 1983, Howell picked up a woman on the side of the road under the pretense that he would drive her home. Shortly after entering the vehicle, Howell pounced on the woman, throwing a rope around her neck and strangling her. Fortunately, the woman was able to escape and reported the incident to the police. Disturbingly, Howell was able to negotiate his charges, eventually settling on the charges of unlawful restraint, which was a misdemeanor. Howell was now free to do as he pleased, knowing that he would only be sentenced to misdemeanor charges. Investigators believe that this was not Howell's first crime, but it was the first time he'd been caught. In the wake of the DNA analysis, Ralph Howell's body was exhumed and a sample of his DNA was obtained from his jawbone. This sample was sequenced, and in November 2022, the Loveland Police Department, in cooperation with other agencies, posthumously charged Ralph Howell with sexual assault and murder of 19-year-old Cheryl Thompson. Whilst Ralph is no longer with us, this conviction brings some closure to Cheryl's family. Cheryl's brother Bill told the media in a statement on behalf of the family, quote, We are glad my sister's killer is dead and can't hurt anyone else. As a small family, we're still glad that they finally got some closure. Hamilton County Prosecutor Joe Dieters told the media, There is no doubt in our mind that Ralph Howe was a serial killer. Along with the murder of Cheryl Thompson, Ralph is believed to have murdered 17-year-old Charmaine Stola, murdered in 1978, 18-year-old Nancy Ann Theobald, murdered in 1977, and 24-year-old Victoria Hincher, murdered in 1976. Unfortunately, DNA was not recovered from these victims at the time of their murder, making it unlikely that law enforcement will be able to positively link Ralph Howell to the murders conclusively. However, due to the circumstances of all three murders and their closeness to Cheryl's murder, they are confident that all four are connected. At this time, it is unclear if the Loveland PD will go forward in trying to exhume these victims. Due to his employment in the trucking industry, law enforcement has stated that there may be other victims outside of the region where Howell lived. They will go forward and submit his DNA nationally to see if there are any more victims connected to him. Now that we're here and you have some closure, how does this feel for you? Oh, it, it feels incredible. I mean, I. I never thought this would happen. Bill Thompson finally got the answers he's been waiting more than four decades for. I'd moved on. I, I didn't think there was any way this was ever going to be solved. Anyone with information about Ralph Howell's movements or any of the cases mentioned are asked to contact the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation at 855-224-6446. Well, that's going to be it for this video. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end. As always, if you want to support the channel, the easiest way is to hit the like button. You can also subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. Otherwise, to support the channel by joining my Patreon or channel membership. I also have merch and you will find all the links in the description box plus a few extras. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter for more. But with that being said, thank you so much for being here and supporting what I do. It is very appreciated. That's it for me. I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.